Today is Monday, May 21st. We are here with our good friends from Emergency Medical Services as part of the Boston Public Health Department um, FY19 budget review. I'd like to wish you a happy EMS week. Uh, in advance and remind folks that this is a public hearing. It is both being broadcast live and recorded on RCN 82, Comcast 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence all electronic devices. At the conclusion of the department's presentation and questions from my colleagues, we will take public testimony. There is sign-in sheets to my left by the door. I ask that you uh, state your name, affiliation, and residence, and please check the box if you do wish to testify. Uh, we are here, as I mentioned earlier, with our good friends from Boston EMS as it pertains to dockets 0559 through 0563, orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, and dockets 0564 and 0565, capital budget appropriation, including load orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd also like to remind folks that um, in the audience that there are numerous ways to uh, get us public testimony first. Uh, you can email us at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Uh, we will have a session on June 5th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. where we will take uh, public testimony on any facet of the budget, which all members of the public are welcome to. Um, I'd like to... Um, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. Uh, to my far left, Councillor Josh Zakem and Councillor Matt O'Malley. To my immediate right, Councillor Council President Andrea Campbell. And to my left, City Councillor at Large Anissa Asabi George. Uh, Chief, welcome and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Uh, Madam President. Good morning, and, uh, <laughs> other members of the council. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, recognizing EMS Week, Councilor Siomo. And uh, I also I do want to thank the body again for the uh, proclamation and the uh, moment you gave us in this chamber a week ago. It was much appreciated, and again, we never take that for granted. It's always a, uh, it's a great opportunity for us. And just quickly, in your, uh, we, we already distributed some uh, packets to you with information in there, but uh, one of the things, that, and we have a slight, small slide presentation to go with my uh, opening remarks. So on, on the first page, I do refer to the uh, 44th Annual National EMS Week thing, and uh, in there, there's a, uh, a list of events that you can take a look at. And I'll just point out that tomorrow, Tuesday, City Hall Plaza, we will have some personnel out here from 10.30 to 1.30 with some uh, demonstrations, some uh, materials, some equipment. So it's a short walk if you're uh, available and you want to say hello. All right, next. All right, so uh, just, just a quick overview. Um, I think, if, so everybody here knows this pretty well. I don't think we have any of the new councils yet today with us, but, and we're gonna make some time to sit down with them individually and you know, try to uh, give them a bit more about the history of the department and where we're at and what's going on, particularly in their districts. But right now, uh, we're, we, are, we are, of course, a bureau of the Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, we offer a two-tiered system response we offer uh, basic life support as well as advanced life support, and a call type is what uh, decides whether you're going to get uh, one or both types of ambulances. In 2017, Boston EMS, we had a total call volume of 126,562 clinical incidents. So those were individual uh, calls for specific complaints. Uh, that resulted in uh, 149,555 ALS and BLS ambulance responses. As I said, sometimes we send more than uh, one ambulance to a particular call, or if it's an MVA that may have several ambulances going. So that's why you see more responses than incidents. 
and that resulted in 86,023 transports to Boston hospitals. We're currently budgeted for 400 full-time uh, employees, and 375 of those are uniformed. With the adoption of the budget that uh, the mayor has submitted to you this year, and uh, you know, hopefully you'll be approving, we're going to be able to increase our FTE count by 20, uh, which will then give us 395 uniformed EMTs and paramedics, and a total FTE count for the department of 420. In our field operations, just a quick overview. Uh, right now, we're operating uh, 21 BLS units and five ALS units from 16 stations citywide during peak hours. Now, that's peak hours are like now, so that's mostly the day shift and the evening shift. Uh, at our lowest ebb, between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., we do drop down to 14 ambulances covering uh, the city because it makes more sense for us to have more ambulances on at 2 in the afternoon, say, the 2 in the morning, just based on historical uh, precedent need. Several crews shift change at a station, and then they repost to a more strategic location determined by a call volume. And I say that because even though we have uh, uh, 26 ambulances on currently, we don't have 21, 26 stations to base them out of. So lots of times we move them around to deploy them where they needed to fill gaps in coverage. Uh, dispatch operations, which is up at uh, one shorter plaza, uh, police headquarters, uh, where the 911 center for the city is. We have EMTs and supervising EMTs who are all Boston EMS Academy trained EMTs who uh, many of them worked in the field. Uh, some still do on occasion. They go out as well. But on top of that, they received uh, uh, additional training, uh, additional certification. They all went to a, uh, APCO, uh, emergency medical dispatcher training, which is what teaches them to use the medical guide cards to give uh, uh, detailed uh, pre-arrival instructions and to pick the best resource to send to the calls and to how to prioritize. Because as, as much as we're staffed up, there are times when we have to prioritize calls and triage them to see which ones to give out first. CMED, uh, which is our uh, coordinating center for uh, the region for the 62 cities and towns around Boston, is for managing either mass casualties, but also for uh, uh, providing patches, uh, radio patches, with uh, ambulances in the field, with hospitals for medical direction and for entry notification. Our next division in our department is our research, training, and quality improvement. And it's a full-time accredited training academy uh, accredited by the, the Commonwealth. It provides continuing education for all uniformed personnel. All members of the department are assigned uh, routinely to training several times a year to get uh, required uh, updates and refresher training and uh, whether it's different, te different techniques. It could be new commission policies, EMS policies, uh, city policies. We, we uh, right to know anything that we have to uh, uh, go over, we were able to do that by scheduling by people, bringing people in. And we do that training on all three shifts. If you work the night shift, you go, if it's your week to go to training, you go to, you go to training there. That way we have those people available, we have to pull them out. Uh, on occasion, sometimes with some of the storms we've had this past uh, couple of winters, we may cancel training uh, so that we can get extra units out in the field. So that's why it's wise for us to train on all three shifts. We have a uh, rigorous six-month training program for our uh, new EMTs. Uh, we are in the pro as I sit here today, we've begun uh, interviews for the next recruit class, which is scheduled to start uh, second week of July. So uh, we did our written exam two weeks ago. Our practical exam was yesterday. And uh, we're, we're really trying to make haste so that we can take the opportunity to get this class in uh, once it's funded for uh, July. We have uh, simulation labs. Uh, we've been buying more state-of-the-art of equipment with the idea of uh, being able to en enhance our skills and just be uh, safer for patients in the field. We offer an affordable basic EMT course, which is open to the public. We offer it twice a year at our training facility, and uh, we offer it at a, at a cost that's about half of what you would pay at a community college. And we only, and, and even at that, we only charge enough to cover our expenses uh, uh, for uh, for materials and, and instructor time up there. That one class we've 
conducted for uh, many years now has uh, in proven to be our most effective uh, tool for recruiting and developing talent from Boston's neighborhoods to help us with uh, diversity, language, race, ethnicity. Uh, a lot of uh, people who work here now have come through that class, and uh, I'll, I'll speak more about that later. Our Special Operations Division and Emergency Preparedness, they've supported 786 special events in 2017. Uh, many of those events took place on this uh, plaza right out here, a lot of the parties or festivals, but also the larger ones like the marathon, a 4th of July celebration, tall ships, uh, you name it, right down to uh, road races, block parties in neighborhoods, uh, elderly events, other things that uh, may require an EMS response or an EMS standby. And the coordination of that is very important because otherwise the ambulances for those events would be coming from the neighborhoods if we didn't pre-plan and have effective plans in place for that. Uh, we're going to be having personnel post out from Boston Calling out at Harvard Stadium coming up this weekend. Uh, that was a particularly busy event for us last year. We want to make sure that that's covered so we're not dragging resources out of Brighton and Austin uh, to be servicing a, uh, a private venue. We also prepare for surge events, including the known and the unknown, stockpiling necessary supplies, uh, the ability to open up medical shelters if we need be and to support OEM. And uh, we, have, uh, we carry a large supply of antidote kits for nerve agent poisonings and other things that the uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security has provided us. We do extensive planning up there in coordination with, uh, with, with the city and with the Uasi region. And uh, our, our training and exercises are used to prepare our personnel for all hazards. And I'll give you an example. Back in 2014, with the concern about uh, Ebola cases uh, coming to our shores, we did a lot of, a lot of training for that, a lot of outfitting, uh, practicing using protective equipment for us and how to package and uh, care for patients. And you know, now with keeping an eye on what's going on in the Congo and the potential that it's starting to spread into municipal areas there and coming out of the uh, countryside, you know, we want to make sure that if we have to dust those plans off, we'll be ready to go. So that's what that area handles. Our community initiatives, uh, they provide uh, public safety, life-saving skills, education. They participate in uh, countless community events and meetings. Uh, we regularly schedule CASI checks and do installations, many of them at low cost or no cost if people qualify for them. We do that out of our garage in Mattapan, and people call up and make appointments. We do CPR training for businesses and community groups. Uh, we have uh, do senior safety presentations on file of life and other, uh, and other programs. And I'll get to the importance of that CPR training in an upcoming slide. And then, of course, we have a support services uh, division, which is our uh, uh, fleet that maintains our ambulances and our uh, supervisory vehicles. Our materials management, which is our ambulance supply, that uh, we'll, where we are rolling out a new inventory system, which will make us more efficient. Uh, every, almost everything we purchase in EMS has an expiration date. Yes, medicines. Yes, but even bandages, uh, plastic oxygen masks. They, Anything you put in an ambulance is an expiration date. So managing that so you always have enough on hand, but so it doesn't have to be thrown out after sitting on a shelf for a year is important. So we're really trying to uh, uh, save money and manage uh, costs there, and that's already starting to show some benefits for us. Uh, technology services takes care of our uh, IT needs, uh, facilities, uh, oversees all of our locations, and we have administration and finance support here, obviously uh, supported by the, uh, the, the main offices up at the uh, Public Health Commission. All right, accomplishments. Uh, just come up with a few. One, I was gonna talk about the, uh, the community assistance team. Last year, uh, this body, when you approved the budget, it included uh, the mayor's request to add four EMT positions, uh, yeah, additional FTEs, to staff this community assistance team, which was designed to uh, go out and it's a non-transport EMS vehicle to help us manage our call volume. As I said, our call volume still keeps rising every year. Our transports 
slightly less so. So that means we're getting more calls for evaluations, for standbys, for persons who may have mental illness out in the community or who may have issues around homelessness or, or quite frankly, you see maybe three or four times a day for a substance abuse problem who have been in a facility, hospital, they leave and you encounter them again maybe two or three times in a day. How do, how do you, and they're refusing care. So this team that was put together is comprised of uh, two EMTs, and currently right now on the day shift, the primary area is the Mass Ave corridor to help out with uh, uh, the patient population that we're uh, uh, seeing there. And on the evening shift, we shift them more downtown to deal with uh, Tremont Street, Cambridge Street, the plaza here, the common downtown crossing, where we have a high percentage of calls that come in as an unknown EMS, which requires a priority priority one response, but that winds up uh, resulting in maybe only 15, I'm sorry, 25% of those patients being transported to hospitals because they're really in, maybe in need of other services, shelter, uh, referral for recovery services. Uh, uh, some of them are just maybe just looking for a place to uh, stay for that one night. And uh, so we make, uh, uh, excuse me. Oh. I have it. I'll just try to give you a quick update on, on how that's been going so far. So uh, looking at some statistics through uh, April 30th of this year, we started the uh, unit on October 30th. We didn't get it going right away because we had to hire the people and get them in. And once we did that, we started them on October 30th and uh, through April 30th. And I believe this information is in your packet as well. No, this one isn't. I'm sorry. I just got this one this morning. I apologize. But uh, they've had over a thousand uh, uh, calls, and uh, they were able to uh, cancel uh, an advanced life support and basic life support unit 29 times. Uh, 187 times they were able to free up the ambulance, cancel an ambulance was coming to free them up for another call, higher or lower priority. Uh, they were able to assist personnel 271 times. And uh, they were able to cancel us for, uh, for other reasons. Perhaps they're helping somebody with a uh, stranded wheelchair or something else that doesn't require an ambulance transport. And it freed up that ambulance to do other calls. And uh, they made 317 referrals to either recovery ser services, uh, uh, engagement center, shelters, and, uh, and other programs. So our personnel feel that it's been a bit of a success because it has been able to do the uh, intended need was to to free up our personnel from some calls, and uh, they've also been able, they've been the first on scene for cardiac arrest. They've been the first on scene for uh, uh, a shooting that occurred down on Temple Place. So they're still able to do immediate life saving care as well until the ambulance gets there. So uh, they're uh, highly motivated, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's been uh, welcomed by the workforce. So thank you for that. Uh, we've, one of the things we've been trying to do is improve our uh, cardiac arrest survival rate. And uh, I was just going to, uh, th there's, there's two graphs here. And uh, Utstein criteria is the one they use when they measure cardiac survival rate. And that's a, a witness cardiac arrest where the person presents in VFib, which is something that is much more amenable to turning them around. Uh, when you shock them with a the defibrillator. Similarly, like you've had several just in this building. Somebody spots somebody down, they call 911, somebody starts compression, and municipal police or anybody in the building grabs a defib off the wall. Uh, those are the ones that lead the most to success when somebody just initiates care right away. Uh, you know, in Boston, we're doing pretty well with our Utstein uh, uh, survival rate, it's 52%. The national average is 33%. Uh, so we're doing pretty good compared to uh, the rest of the country. If you look to the column, however, on the right, cardiac arrest, where well, we find that there were bystanders doing CPR, and that can just be compression only. They don't have to do mouth to mouth. 39% uh, nationwide is what we see. In Boston, it's only 23%. So we do feel like this area for improvement there. Uh, last year, uh, we trained to our Community Initiatives Bureau 3,051 people in CPR. 
and we feel like that's going to be effective and help us. So if we can bump up those numbers, we can only expect that our uh, our overall survival rate will even improve there. So we're making that a uh, priority for our, uh, all of our community trainings um, this year. We also offer CPR videos on our uh, Boston EMS website, which is linked to the city website. Uh, they've been around for a year. In those videos, and there's a little picture of them in the screenshot, we have uh, uniformed EMTs from Boston EMS who are native speakers who offer the, the instruction and how to do compression-only CPR. They do it, in, of course, in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Cantonese, Portuguese Creole, Haitian Creole. And uh, I'm not sure how many times they've been viewed, but uh, I know that uh, a, lot of, a lot of groups have taken advantage of that. Uh, East Boston. Uh, East Boston was certainly in the news. There was a lot of discussion about it. And uh, uh, back on March, 20, March 12th, we added a second ambulance to ambulance uh, to East Boston. Uh, A27 is its call sign. It's uh, it was added to address the rising response times in the neighborhood and also the, the main concern that once that ambulance over there is occupied, it's transporting to a hospital on the Boston side of the harbor. So it's basically out of there for a little while. Over the years, we relied on a system of as soon as Ambulance 7 got a call, we would start another unit over from downtown, whether it was Ambulance 1, 15, 6, 8, you name it. We had a pecking order, which we sent them over. As our call volume has increased over the years, that didn't really service as well uh, anymore because the likelihood of those units being clear was getting less and less. So we did start to have gaps, and our, uh, our response time goals weren't uh, our our priority on median response times in East Boston uh, were really uh, rising and compared to uh, citywide. So it was called for. We then instituted this uh, truck on uh, the day shift and evening shift. And uh, because on nights we're doing OK, we're monitoring our, our response times there. We've already seen a 46-second uh, a 40 second, 40 second, 46 second reduction in our priority one median response times on the day shift over in East Boston, which may not sound like much, but it is significant because it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's more than a half minute uh, drop in uh, our priority one median over there. And we've also uh, noticed a one minute, a full minute reduction in priority one median response times on the evening shift over in East Boston. So we are starting to see a benefit from that. Uh, significantly though, in We've also seen that the benefit from that is in Charlestown, South Boston, and downtown, we're seeing reductions in our priority one median response time in Charlestown and South Boston as well. Because as I pointed out prior to that, that second unit that would be going over to East Boston would be coming from those neighborhoods or from the seaport or somewhere else. So adding that zone impact truck as, as, as good as it's been for East Boston, it's, it's benefited uh, everybody in Charlestown and downtown as well. And I expect to see uh, further improvement because Massport is in the process of constructing a second garage for us at the site over on Prescott Street on their property. And they are putting in a, a new larger office trailer for us. So once that happens, and I've been assured that's going to happen this summer, uh, that we will be able to shift change that unit over there. Currently, Ambulance 27 is a reserve vehicle that changes out of Shirley Street in Roxbury. So crews come in, they have to take the truck there, uh, drive it over to East Boston, take their calls. But then at shift change, which is you know busy parts of day, they have to travel back, and then their relief jumps in and goes over because we don't have a place to garage it over there, which is a requirement by OEMS. But once that garage is uh, completed and it is fast-tracked, uh, uh, again, we've been assured it will be in the summer, we'll be able to uh, change that truck, have both the trucks report in East Boston, and that should uh, greatly help uh, uh, with any outlying calls over in East Boston. So we're going to see further improvement. Uh, human trafficking, we've, our medical director, Dr. Sophia Dyer, has, you know, taken the lead uh, in EMS agencies, really, you know, around the country in developing uh, training for EMS personnel in, uh, you know, how to recognize, how to suspect 
uh, people who could be victims of human trafficking and everything that that in, entails. Uh, we did a similar uh, training years ago for suspected victims of domestic violence where uh, what to look for, some maybe some subtle signs, so, or uh, how to uh, maybe approach a patient and how to do it safely when they may be out of ear short of others, or, or maybe just pass that information out of the hospital where they have a better ability to, uh, uh, to talk with the patients, uh, you know, away from somebody who may be trying to control them or manipulate them or, or, uh, you know, or try to influence them. And uh, so we've been, we've been rolling that training out with all the recruit classes. We've done it with our supervisors, and we're uh, rolling it out with our incumbent workforce as well. And that was training that was done in conjunction and developed with the uh, uh, Family Justice Center with Boston Public Health Commission uh, programs up in Brighton, and also with the Sexual Assault Unit from the Boston Police Department. Lieutenant Donna Gavin has worked with us uh, over the years on various projects. and. Uh, it, it, it's been great to work with that group. Continuing partnerships. Uh, and bear with me, I'm almost done. Uh, so uh, we, we we're, we're in a good position because we do gather a lot of information on calls. And uh, we share a lot of that information with our partners in public health, uh, but also with city departments. One is Vision Zero. We continue to support roadway safety measures to the use of our data to identify hotspot locations throughout the city. Uh, over the years, some of our information around pedestrians, around bicyclists, uh, cars, what types of trucks are involved, or what the cars involve, uh, even getting down to some granularity on the bikes, was it bike versus bike, was it bike versus a door, which we can pull a lot of the information out of our uh, electronic charts. And we share that with uh, transportation officials here. And some of that has helped to uh, inform them where you're gonna put the bike lines, bike lanes next, because we're seeing more severe or frequent, or are there issues around certain intersections for pedestrians? They use a lot of that data to try to make uh, traffic calming and other decisions down there. And you know, we're very proud to say that we've been a quiet partner in that. Uh, one of the things you can, uh, the public can see now is uh, the public can access locations of roadway incidents on the city's website uh, we verify the mode while uh, we do protect the patient's, uh, you know, uh, medical history and conditions. We don't put any of that on there. But the police department pulls the information from CAD about various informations, and we will confirm whether it was bicycle, pedestrian, or uh, uh, motor, motor vehicle in, in uh, nature. And uh, they use that to populate this map that's uh, on the city's website so people can do their own analysis or whatever, because we all get a lot of requests for data. And this way it's coming from one source and it's been vetted by all the agencies. Uh, we also uh, work very closely with the uh, Bureau of Recovery, Se Recovery Services in the commission uh, and with, uh, uh, the May obviously, in the mayor's uh, office of... Uh, Dry mouth. <laughs> One second. Excuse me, the Mayor's Office Re Recovery Services as well. Uh, we collect uh, data on a, on a daily basis. We review all suspected narcotic related incidents, uh, and we have for uh, over 12 years now. We've, uh, uh, re we record trends, uh, I believe we've included some of that information uh, in your packet. And uh, I know there was some, some questions. And we also try to use that to try to, uh, you know, help, in, help inform where we might want to do uh, more outreach, more knock-in training in the community. Again, anything that our information can be used for to help further the efforts to, to deal with uh, this epidemic of uh, opioid use is, is welcome by us. Uh, it, I know there were some questions uh, last week around it, and we can get into it later if you want. But no, we are still continuing to see an upward trend in uh, total uh, narcotic-related illnesses, uh, an increase in the use of administration of Narcan, and uh, probably a slight increase in deaths. They're on par with last year. It's still early to tell because we do get fluctuations where some months, some weeks aren't as bad as others, and then some weeks are worse than others. So we really have to see how, uh, 
how it rolls out at the end of the year. But, uh, but, but just to tell you, as of, uh, as of last week, uh, total narcotic-related illnesses that Boston EMS encountered uh, was 1,214, as opposed to 1,049 last year. Uh, referred to the medical examiner um, last this year, 29 cases last year. That was 30, so that's about even. Uh, Narcan, 20% uh, increase in the amount of Narcan that's been administered this year. And that's by whether it was, uh, we, we, we go by whoever gave it first. So if, if police, fire, or us, or uh, the shelters, or anyone else gave it, we, we only count it once. That means that's, that's an individual patient who received at least one dose of Narcan. Uh, one number that's uh, a little concerning that uh, is up this year is the cardiac arrests that were transported to hospitals. We're, compared to historical numbers, we're, we're encountering more patients that aren't being referred to the medical examiner because they're uh, found to be pulseless, and we've initiated CPR, we maybe get pulses back, we transport them to the hospital, only to find out maybe even days later that uh, these personnel don't wake up, they actually do succumb, or they get taken off life support because they had been uh, found down for a bit. So we're having some, some initial success uh, resuscitating them. So the cardiac arrest transported uh, this year, as of last week, was 11, and at the same time period last year was six. And our feeling is that most, many of those do go on to wind up in the suspected uh, you know, death column as well. So that's why I'm saying we're still pretty much on par with last year. Sorry. Uh, oh, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the best team. We've been working with the best team. I know that uh, this, this body approved uh, additional positions for the Boston Police Department to put clinicians out in the field. I believe they have three right now and they're trying to get three more. We've brought them into all of our trainings uh, this last training cycle when people come in off shifts. One, to make sure our people know they're a resource and they're out there. There are some people, again, who don't necessarily have to go to an emergency room who can get um, committals or, or transported with these clinicians who are with the Boston Police Department, perhaps uh, directly to Solomon Carter or to the Lindemann, because maybe that's particularly what they need. So that's one thing that does free us up, up from a call that sometimes are difficult to manage, and, uh, and also trying to get the patient to a, a location what they really need. Maybe they don't have to go sit in an emergency room for four hours to get, to get cleared to, to go there. So we're trying to take advantage of that and enhance our training so we can also get uh, better with dealing with the many more uh, uh, psychiatric emergencies that we're encountering in the field. And our initiatives for this year uh, include, uh, we're you know, the, the rise in call volume and, uh, respond and subsequent response times. Uh, the mayor has uh, recommended and submitted uh, in the budget to increase our FTE count by 20 additional uh, uniform staff. Those would be EMTs coming in the door. Uh, that would be terrific. Uh, as you recall, two years ago when you last uh, increased us by 20. We used that, we deployed two additional ambulances on the day and evening shift, our two busiest shifts, and a third one on the night shift. Uh, right now, our plans would be to, uh, to, to, to follow suit there, to make sure that we're uh, adding more of those zone impact trucks out there to fill areas that we see our response times are creeping up, similarly to what we saw in East Boston. And that'll also allow us that, if that one of those trucks will be that ambulance 27 in East Boston, because currently now we're staffing that 100% on overtime. So when we started doing that in September, I'm sorry, March 12th, uh, we estimated that was gonna come at a cost of $175,000 in overtime. Uh, it's, you know, it's been money well spent. Well, we've seen the improvements in the area, but with the increase of these personnel, which we'll be hiring in July, and then they'll be graduating six months hence, uh, they'll be then regular duty personnel there, which is uh, great for us. Um, 
one of the things we've been trying to do is uh, enhance our recruitment and uh, the diversity and offer a pathway for our residents to become EMTs and to come and apply for us at Boston EMS. As I alluded to earlier, our training academy has been, our EMT training class has been our best route over the last um, dozen years for promoting race, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, language capability for us. And the biggest bar to hiring when we post for recruit class is that you have to already be a certified EMT. So with, with that in mind, uh, we approached the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development this year to see if we couldn't really bump up our ability to get uh, qualified city residents to come and take our training. And they liked the idea, and uh, they worked very uh, hard with us. They were terrific to work with, and uh, they have developed a program where, uh, and you have a flyer in your, in your packet, where they've been uh, interviewing applicants, they've been uh, doing a, a lot of work for us. And uh, actually, what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask Laura Siegel, our uh, chief of staff here at Boston EMS, who's been working pretty much in uh, lockstep with them, to give you a, a quick description, because Laura's done so much of the heavy lift on this, and I want to make sure that she gets some credit, too. C certainly. It's been a great partnership, and uh, they've interviewed uh, about 100 candidates, they have about 300 that have applied, so they will continue to interview. And those individuals who are selected, they're looking at about 30 candidates, will be enrolled in our upcoming EMT class in August. That will make them, by the end of the calendar year, um, finish with the class so that by the spring, when we do a hiring again, we would have those who completed the program eligible to work for us. And again, it's been a great program. They will work with the candidates throughout the uh, process. So not only will they offer them a scholarship for the EMT class, they are um, including a three-week pre-class program for them to ensure that this is what they want to do and to provide some, some pre-employment and pre-EMT class uh, study tips and other training, professional development. And then throughout the class, they will be checking in with our training program to ensure that they are appropriately supported, they receive the mentorship, they receive study skills, et cetera, and that will continue into employment with us to ensure that we have that retention of these candidates. No, thanks, Laura. And, and one of the, uh, uh, a few of the things in there was when we met with them, we talked about some of the potential bars to people uh, uh, coming to work for us. You know, taking an EMT class, which for us, our, our class was fairly low cost, was $750. When we would go out to different community groups and we would approach young people, the, the first thing is say, well, is there a payment plan? Is there this, is there that? And we really weren't st structured for that. Or uh, are, there, are there scholarships? And the union did offer some, and now and then somebody would uh, make a little gift to the Relief Association and they would sponsor one. But those were kind of sort of catch as catch can. So their ability to uh, you know finance uh, this for personnel is terrific, and one of the things the Boston EMS Recruit Academy has now been approved uh, by the Office of Labor and Workforce Development uh, as an official, this will qualify as an apprenticeship, the same as a, uh, somebody going into a, the, the trades, mm -hmm. because it meets the minimum uh, uh, requirements to qualify as an apprenticeship. And so I'm hoping that this whole idea could just catch on with uh, either other departments or with uh, uh, other EMS agencies around because it is it is a good opportunity for young people. <laughs> and with that, I'll stop. Thank, thank you, Chief. And uh, shortly after you started your presentation, we were joined by uh, Councilors Frank Baker, Ed Flynn, Michelle Wu, Ayanna Presley, and Tim McCarthy. Um, well, since you ended on retention, how is retention um, going with? the current um, workforce that we have? Like, are you able to backfill the necessary positions based on retirements or other factors of people leaving the job? We've been able to backfill with, uh, you know, regular class. We've had minimum one recruit class per year. The last couple of years, we've been successful and supported uh, by maybe having two uh, mm -hmm. per year. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 
For example, uh, in anticipation of the uh, 20 FTEs coming up, we've already started a process uh, which would bring in uh, 20 additional personnel. Now, since then, uh, we've lost, I believe, four personnel through either retirement. We just got to notice another member's retiring at the end of this month. And uh, regrettably, we just received uh, two uh, letters of resignation from uh, fairly recent EMTs, people who are on the job less than five years, but uh, they're relocating, one to Texas and one to South Carolina for family needs. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, uh, that's, th that still is an issue. However, uh, one of the things that uh, public health's been very good about supporting uh, ours has been when we've put a class on before, say if we anticipate we had 18 openings, uh, we know that we lose some people in the process. Some people self-select out, or maybe they say, you know, this isn't really what I thought I was getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, in, in other years, uh, consistently allowed us to even bring on a couple of extra personnel. Uh, because they know that by the end of that six-month period, given our historical attrition, we're going to lose a couple of more bodies. So the idea is uh, we try not to let seats be vacant for very long here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it takes a little while to establish and put a class together, and that's why sometimes we do have unfilled vacancies for uh, several months. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we get that opportunity, sometimes we actually almost will go over our FTE count just to, to get them in the process. For it, yeah. right. right. And uh, the, we've been very proactive with that mm -hmm. with, with everyone's help. The retention, we've, over the years, well, maybe about the first 20 or so years that I was maybe even paying any attention to that before, you know, I got this position almost 10 years ago, we used to average about 13 people a year who left for various reasons, retired, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they decided to go on to nursing, a PA school, some have gone to medical school. Um, you know, some of it is some people just uh, look at uh, the jobs a little bit arduous, mm -hmm. and some people say, geez, I like medicine, but I also like it with a roof over my head and warm and dry and air conditioned in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so some people do move on, right. and some people, uh, if given a chance, they'll maybe go to police or fire for, for other reasons, stuff over there when an exam comes up. Right. Uh, or on occasion, people relocate, which... Right. I'm sure there's obviously all kinds of reasons. I, got, I guess I'd be more concerned with people leaving for another EMS job if we're not competitive with salary benefits, or uh, you seeing people like going from getting trained by us and then shortly thereafter maybe going to work for another um, EMS or private transport company. Yeah, we thank you, Council. We, from what we've seen, we've done like our exit interviews to talk to people. We we don't lose too many to to the mm -hmm. privates. So obviously, mm -hmm. our. Uh, Wages benefits here uh, are very competitive Good. with that. Uh, where we do lose some people uh, who, unfortunately, who we train and even we've, we've even lost some uh, paramedics, uh, they get a lot of exposure here. They get a lot of practice here. They get a lot of excellent training here. They get a lot of enhanced training that, that, that you don't see in other agencies. And so they do become desirable. And if you get somebody now who is on a list, they get a phone call from maybe some of the suburban fire departments that offer an ambulance, they may actually, some of them will take um, uh, uh, the same money or less money. They'll be uh, attracted, however, by uh, uh, a work schedule. We work uh, eight 24 hours in a month mm -hmm. shifts, or, or or the call volume just, just isn't the same. You know, you're not doing... Mm -hmm. Uh, 350 calls in a 24-hour period with 22 trucks, and uh, mm -hmm. so they might be attracted to go there. So it's really it's a lifestyle thing. We've lost people right. to departments on the Cape, or uh, or some suburbs, mm -hmm. and then they have the opportunity to go out and work right. another business on the side. So some of it is a lifestyle reason why they sure. leave. But we're able to keep up because obviously our population, and we've talked about this for the past several years, our population continues to, to rise and it seems like we're always trying to keep up and where it looks like most of the response times have somewhat leveled off, but you know we're kind of uh, chasing our tail in so far as the population keeps going up, your, your call demand keeps going up, and I'm just 
the historical FTE, so we're going up to 395 in FY19. We were at 375 in 18. Where, what were we 17, 16, do you recall? For you to formed? Sure. Well, we were, uh, we, well, we were less than that, but we were, we were opposed back in, I think, 2009, 2008. Uh, we, we, were, we were approaching this level now. Mm -hmm. we, as a matter of fact, uh, we had job offers out, and we had a class of 44 that was getting ready to come on. And uh, as you recall, that's when the, um, economy. I think it was the uh, housing uh, bubble burst and the whole recession right. uh, came in. Uh, uh, the police wound up canceling a class. They laid off their cadets. Mm -hmm. um, fire held off. Can they canceled the class. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that class that was five days away from starting, we had to send them all letters saying, sorry, we'll keep you in mind um, in the future when we can. <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, we will now with, with, with this uh, with this funding cycle here, will have you know finally caught up, mm -hmm. you know, with that. You know, unfortunately, what happened after that was uh, with that freeze in hiring that all city departments suffered through for a couple of years. Uh, uh, we had we continued to take some of our attrition losses. Mm -hmm. So our recruit classes after that were really geared towards uh, maintaining the status quo, filling the seats that we had then, and uh, you know, expansion was a little bit difficult because. Uh, but, but, you know, the last couple of years now, we've seen right. two years ago, 20 personnel. Uh, last year, the four. But that was important last year, even though it was just four, you know. But it was, uh, that was important because we were looking at the rise in call volume and response times and trying to be smarter about how we manage it. How do we prioritize calls? Because we know every department, you know, I'll come here every year and ask you for more personnel and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not shy about that, but I, but I know everyone's got uh, uh, competing interests, right, mm -hmm. in other departments. And so what we want to do is uh, we want to manage as much as we can. So, for example, in the cases of downtown here where we had a high percentage of the unknowns, if we can manage and steer that, at least so that we can try to keep pace, as you say. We keep adding people, but, you know, add them wisely, put them where we are. So we're, we're very much uh, trying to be, you know, data-driven on that right. and uh, be able to demonstrate the need when, it, when right. it's there. Well, let me, let me uh, end my line of questioning with thanking the mayor and my colleagues for their commitment to continue to, um, you know, support EMS and support... Uh, more units on the street, more personnel on the street as, as the, the demand is there. So I want to thank you, Chief, for all the work you do and all the men and women in the field. And let me now uh, give Councilor O'Malley the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know that I've ever been the first in, uh, in the queue, so I'm <laughs> delighted, particularly for this, uh, for this uh, uh, topic. Chief, I think that Boston EMS are the unsung heroes of our, our public safety officers. You, your men and women work day in and day out. I've done a number of ride-alongs, and I, I've told this story before, but it bears repeating. I was out with Ed a couple years ago, and the number 420 calls was on the, um, the dash, and I assumed it was 420 calls for the week. It wasn't. It was 420 calls for a 24-hour period. And just that night, I mean, we hit everything. And, and I just really value the work that you do. And it's, it's evident by your leadership that we've got such the best and the brightest in the city, so in the country, working for Boston EMS. So thank you for that. Um, delighted to see an additional class. You said 25 additional new um, EMTs and paramedics. Well, well, 20 is the increase in the FTEs, yep. but we'll also be uh, attempting to fill up uh, uh, other vacancies that are coming up between now and then. Okay. So, yes. And is, uh, is it a split between EMTs and paramedics of the new positions you're looking? Or is that to be Well, for the, new, for the new hires, it's, it's always uh, EMT recruits uh, who transition into the EMT role. Uh, gotcha. Some of them may have medic certification, but we, we do our paramedic as a uh, promotional opportunity. Gotcha. And we do convert some of those jobs. In fact, we promoted uh, five or six paramedics earlier uh, this year who are EMT positions that get converted over. So if we lose medics, then we'll do a promotional process there, similar for supervisors, sure. our lieutenants, our captains. Sure. Um, and is that figure enough, given the fact that the population of the city is growing so much? I mean, I, I think it's any, any increase is a good one. I know the mayor is committed to that. But mm -hmm. should we even be thinking down the road, you know, 
two, three years from now of growing that even more? Yeah, well, that, that's a good idea. What we're, what we're trying to do also is come in line with, uh, you know, it was Imagine Boston uh, yep. 2030, so that what do we think the number's going to be? Well, our residential population is, it, it's, I know it's under 700,000 now, uh, but our daytime population, our service population, you know, the people who come to work, play, go to hospitals, you name it here, Boston swells by, yep, yep. Uh, I'm told, 1.2 million is our service population we have to uh, take care of. So, you know, with ideas of uh, you know, what's the proper way to look? Because like, like I said before, everything's data driven. Every, yep. you know, any one of us come in and say, we need more help, and that's fine. And that's, and it's true, but it's show me, demonstrate. Yeah. I, are you, are and we, we make, should. Are like we doing the best? Measure gets managed Yeah, well. where we're deploying Absolutely. people, how we're responding to calls, everything. And, uh, but I think that if we look at all of that and you know, going forward and stuff, we'll be able to make good decisions, good recommendations when we do come into budget cycles. Good. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Chief. Um, program revenue has increased uh, slightly by about $235,000. What accounts for that? Well, we've had, uh, you know, an increase in uh, transports, uh, mostly. I know about two-thirds or so, you know, of, of a budget historically is what we've been able to get from billings for uh, transports yep. from... Is that on par, the two-thirds sort of reimbursement, is that on par with other cities in the United States? That I'd have to get back Just to you more on. curious yeah, than anything sure. else. Yeah, I want to see if, if, if it's high, may even be higher, just sort of given the proximity. Um, and then let me see. So, and how big is your fleet of ambulances? How many do you have right now? So right now we're, uh, we're licensed uh, to have 50 ambulances in our fleet. And uh, we, and that, so that includes uh, the frontline units. Uh, that does not include the uh, several that are on order and will be delivered uh, this month as well, or the ones that we will order next fiscal year, as we've been, uh, you know, in the budget, will be approved to order additional trucks there. So what we'll do is then we take some of the uh, older trucks that are, uh, you know, really at the end of their life cycle, we'll, we'll take them off the bottom. Uh, some of those do get uh, sold. Some yeah. of those get transferred to the... Uh, some have been used by recovery services to help out with a, uh, uh, some mobile shops. Other ones uh, have the years the uh, police department converted one into its, one of its crime scene units. Interesting. And what's the, what's, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just yeah. want to be. What's the um, lifespan of an ambulance? How long does it usually last? Four years or so? Yeah, we can get four or five years uh, out of one. But, but typically what it is is uh, in frontline use, uh, Day-to-day -day use, 24-hour service, uh, as you say, in a busy system. Uh, three years, a uh, little bit longer, pushing it. You know, after that, you know, systems, you know, yeah. they start. Then, then it's then they're more. We, we don't want to. It's fine for us to try to, you know, extend our car lifetime. We want to make sure that the no, thank you, thank you. Uh, and and what we do is no. The, the idea is we we want to be able to uh, uh, rotate out uh, frontline. Uh, Ambulance is about uh, every every third year, and we have finally gotten back on a replacement schedule for that. For a couple of years, that was put on hold. Yeah. Back in 2013, when uh, we lost the uncompensated care, even though a lot of people still didn't have insurance, uh, there was some uh, some pretty good cuts, and we had some layoffs in the department. And uh, one of the ways we balanced the budget for about two years there was to uh, really cut back on our replacement schedule for vehicles. Again, two years ago, with the 20 additional personnel that uh, you all approved for us, we purchased uh, 12 ambulances that year, then 10 the next year, uh, this year um, seven, but we also replaced uh, several non-ambulance vehicles. Uh, some of our units that you'll see out here in the plaza, they call them a squad. They're marked SUVs. We use them for a lot of the details. Yep. Some of those were model year 2001s. And it, even though, believe it or not, they were still running, it's, it's just not worth the money to put into them to yep. keep them going. So we replaced, oh, maybe about uh, nine non-ambulance vehicles this year. And we're going to go back up to replacing eight ambulances next year, including a new uh, uh, bariatric unit that has the uh, heavy lift on the back 
because we do utilize the one we have now you know, several times a week. So uh, we're, you know, we're making investments in that. We're replacing our uh, res uh, materials management. They had two vans, two trucks that they used to deliver uh, supplies to our stations and to bring back dirty equipment that's in need of cleaning. Uh, they, their vehicles were old as well. So we're trying to do the upgrades across the board uh, and we've had great support. Great, and then finally, last question. Um, great to see the uh, the new project and the capital budget for the EMS Training Academy. Where is that gonna be located? Well, that's being determined. I will say that, uh, so two years ago, there was $50,000 was approved for a study for uh, an EMS facility in the seaport and $50,000 for, for an academy. And uh, they, I believe they, uh, to get more bang for the buck, I think they combined it with uh, one particular vendor, I think it was DHK. They completed their uh, needs assessment and study and made some recommendations for the seaport and that'll be awaiting further action. Yeah, for the training academy, they completed their needs assessment, square footage, what do we need as far as locker space, office space, uh, workout facilities as such. And they started doing some fit testing for some city properties, one of which included uh, the second floor out at uh, Rivermore Street, out in West oh, Roxbury, right. out where uh, the archives are down below yep. and uh, BPL has holdings out right there. Behind the Millennium Park, that's right. Yes, yes, so that was one of the, uh, that's one of the sites they're looking at. And uh, what my understanding now is that uh, the money that they were putting in there now was going to be for, for design. So, so we're still multi years off from this, but glad to see that this administration, because of your advocacy, is pushing this. We, it is high time that we have a dedicated EMS training facility, and this would be, uh, I'd obviously love to see it in District 6. So, Yeah, no, thank you. And when they, uh, I mean, uh, our experience here is when you've, they've done a study, and then they, similar to when you built a Mattapan garage for us, right? Yep. There was a study, and then there was a design phase, which was the next year, and then yep. the next year they voted on. Uh, yeah. funding the construction. So that actually went pretty quick in, in that type of thing. We, we were uh, moving in there in three years from, from inception. So Good. Excellent. Well, great job with the improved cardiac arrest uh, stats. That's terrific. And um, just thank you for all you do, everybody on your team. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank and, you, Council. And, Chief, I just want to add that I don't think we need a study to know that we need an extra garage in Austin Brighton. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can probably you. save those dollars. Thank Council. you. Yep. Um, and I would like to recognize we've been joined by uh, City Councilor at Large, Michael Flaherty, Chair, recognizes Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siamo and uh, Chief and Laura. Thank you guys for being here and thank you to your team and all the men and women who serve in EMS. You guys do do amazing work that often probably doesn't get recognized, so I just wanted to start with thank yous. Um, just echoing Councilor O'Malley's point about the training facility. Yes, it's time. Um, you guys are doing just phenomenal work, and so obviously anything that we can do to support you. Um, just a quick question on, while I'm happy to see the increase in the uh, full-time employees, FTEs, um, given the population is going up, what we're seeing from the 2030 plan, um, your service population and the difference between the service population and uh, residents who live here, um, it, what would your ideal budget look like in terms of you know how many full-time employees would ideally be adequate based on where we're going in population uh, size um, increases? Um, what would your equipment look like? I mean, I, obviously every department doesn't always get what they want, but I mm -hmm. think it's important for us to have a sense of um, what does EMS need? I think for the police department, for the police department, there's a gap and we often talk about that, particularly with the police department needing more officers and why that's important. Um, I'm just curious what um, you think, Chief Hooley, in terms of what, what you think the need is and where there might be a gap. And this is all positive questioning, you know. Yep. Okay, thank you, Councilor. Uh, well, again, we, we have to, to look at it as we go. We saw that we, we originally, when we put on the uh, two additional units on days and evenings, we saw uh, some improvement initially. We came down about uh, uh, 30 seconds on our uh, citywide priority one median response time. But then as call volume increased over the next two years, and uh, in, in maybe even more of that, 
types of calls that we're getting where we're doing more uh, problem solve on street corners, similar to like, yeah, but what the police are doing. It isn't always like you get there and someone's got a broken leg and you patch them up and you make them feel better and you take care of the needs, you transport them to the hospital. Some of the calls get, you know, a little bit uh, more complicated that you're dealing with, trying to sort out what's what's really going on and some of the other issues that are out there. We, we then, those gains were eroded, you know, those response times, and they've started slipping back down. So when we did come in and we, we met with uh, the mayor's budget office and we met with, uh, and obviously with the full support of uh, public health, we showed that we had further need and we were trying this other approach with the community assistance team to try to manage around the edges, you know, and try to, you know, trim away some of the problems we were getting with some of the increase to see like what, you know, we want to make sure we're getting the right unit to the right truck at the right time. And with that, uh, you know, I, I do believe there's a way to really to develop a formula so we can see and project that so that we can see what the needs are going to be, uh, not just in different neighborhoods, but, but citywide. What do we need to do for, for growth? What do we need to do to uh, meet the, the demands like relative to age, you know, whether it's pediatric population, the elderly population. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity for us there to come up with some really uh, detailed planning for as we head towards 2030. So, so we will know. And also, uh, we, we've gotten back, as I alluded to, my, our replacement schedule for ambulances, but then we also, we want to look at our other equipment, like our, our stretches, the power lift stretches now, mm. and they, they cost more than the first couple of cars I bought myself, you know? So all that stuff has shelf life. So the idea of trying to get on uh, program replacement schedules so that, uh, so that we're not suddenly having to uh, uh, come back looking for a large amount of money to replace uh, you know, aging infrastructure. So we, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, across all of that, uh, all areas of our department, is to come up with uh, better ways of doing that. And that might help me more to uh, answer your question mm -hmm. and, to, and to inform future years as we go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, that would be helpful in terms of just, I guess I'll turn this into an information request post this hearing, um, what that formula might look like, um, just what you just explained sort of in writing, what that might look like going forward five, ten years out, because um, then I think that might inform for us um, what the long-term future looks like and where the gaps are and, and where we can be great advocates on behalf of you and, and your team. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank you guys, and we will have hearings coming up related to this um, for the work on uh, getting me data for the hearing order and related to diversity in our public safety agencies. Um, doing this in partnership with Councilor McCarthy and looking forward to it. Um, Chief, thank you for being so responsive. Laura, thank you for being extremely responsive um, and frankly digging in. Um, you don't always see that, believe it or not, um, getting into the details and the weeds. So I really appreciated the edits, the back and forth. It was very helpful. Um, we're working on settling on some dates now, particularly for the first hearing and follow-up hearings. Um, and look forward to you guys participating. And Laura, you as well. I'm sure you might have more time in the chief. We'll probably be running around all over the city. Um, but look forward to you guys participating in these conversations and coming up with more uh, short-term and long-term initiatives to do better with, with respect to the numbers and those folks of color that we were talking about. Um, I also want to applaud your efforts with the workforce development team, trends team, um, that EMT program, the cadet, pro uh, cadet program, the ENT training program is fantastic. I think a lot of folks don't even know that it exists, so I've been telling people about it. Um, I think it's fantastic. I think it's thinking outside the box on how you can change these numbers, um, particularly for our, obviously our city um, residents. I think it's innovative, and I, I hope to be able to come up with more ideas, not just with respect to EMS, but also our other public safety agencies around what are some of the creative things we can do that are within our control, and other things that might have to change with respect to the state. Who knows? But I think um, we could be doing a lot more, and you guys are demonstrating that, particularly with this partnership with the workforce development team. So thank you. Um, my last question, just to be mindful of other people's time, with the um, program now, Laura, you were talking about, right now I think there are 30 
going, uh, starting in August, or there were 300 people that applied, 100 were interviewed. There are 30 that are going to be expected to start in August. So what we asked them to do was actually follow a pre-employment screening process. Okay. And so the next step is they will actually do a physical exam and an aptitude test. The aptitude test isn't part of the normal hiring process, but this is to see if they're prepared to take the EMT class. And so after that, they're thinking between 25 to 30 people will become eligible to take the EMT class. And do we know the demographics of these folks right now? No, no. So they are okay. specifically um, recruiting throughout the city mm -hmm. and looking for um, enhancing diversity, including race, ethnicity, and language capacity. Um, and, and women. And I'll just add that too. Gender too. Yes. Um, and gender too. I know that's important too. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested in what the demographics ultimately become for that group. I know for the cadet program, BPD, they follow that. Um, they have that same intention of making sure that it's more women and more people of color um, when doing this work, which is important. But um, thank you guys for the work you're doing. Thank you for the partnership. Thank you to your incredible team, some of whom are sitting in the back and may not be on TV, but folks, there are people here who do this work with the chief and with Laura. Thank you guys, and thank you to the men and women who do the work on the ground every single day. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sabi George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, thank you, Chief and Laura, for being here. Just to follow up on Councilor Campbell's questions on the City Academy. So that's different than, or it's sort of a, a pre-step before the regular Boston EMS Academy? Correct. That's, that's to um, facilitate uh, young people getting, be, becoming certified as an EMT, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is a daunting thing for some people and some maybe just uh, financially and uh, or for, for some others who maybe uh, they've been out of school for a little bit and they need a little bit of tutorial, you know, brush up and some And then coaching. they could qualify to enter the regular EMT, uh, your regular class. Yes, oh yes, yeah. That, that was the most attractive thing uh, to, the, uh, to the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development was they said that, hey, you're telling us there's actually a job maybe waiting at the end of this. And it was like, absolutely, because we've been, we've been averaging two recruit classes a year right. just to keep up with you know, retirements, other people going, and then hopefully with more expansions or like we're experiencing now. So the, the need has been there, and our pool of applicants has been decreasing the last few years. Uh -huh. uh, we used to have maybe 290 people sign up to take our exam, and after they went to the written and the practical, we'd be interviewing 66 people for 20 positions. You know, right now we're interviewing, um, I believe, 30 people this week for uh, 20 to 24 positions. So it's, uh, it's, it, that's a little bit discouraging. So we want to get more personnel in. And then and what's the um, $750 cost for? Is that for the City Academy or is that for? Well, so that's our, uh, uh, that's our Boston EMS EMT class. So, pr so prior to City Academy's involvement, uh, we would just post a date that, hey, we're we'll running an EMT class. It's Tuesdays and Thursday evenings and every other Saturday for the next four months, say. Uh, you could sign up and basically it was, uh, you get your money in first, you pay in full, you got a seat. Yeah, and so that's just the class, and then that individual who signed up for that class could go work for a private. It's not Correct. for Boston EMS. This is in place of some of the private agencies that run an EMS class. No, that, that, that's correct. They, because somebody who wants to take an EMT class, they could say, hey, that's cheaper than Bunker Hill or Mass right. Bay, and they could come here. Uh, again, the reason we kept it cheap was uh, or affordable was because we wanted to be able to take care of our own folks in the city. Now, obviously, people from the, this program coming to the Office of Workforce Development, they have to be residents to qualify for that program and a benefit. And, you know, there's nothing saying that uh, going forward, even people who don't qualify for that program, it's encouraging to see as many people have put in for it. Mm -hmm. If they're city residents, uh, with this, there's no reason they can't apply for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do to uh, help them as well. Through the regular academy, how much does it cost to train an EMT um, just to, to put someone through your school, through your academy? What's the investment that we're making? I would have to pull that number together for you. Because yeah, I'm that, curious what we're, what we're yeah. investing in in each of those. Yeah, because that would include, uh, for, well, for example, it's the examination, the, uh, the pre-screening. It's the, it includes uh, 
Uh, you know, there's minimal cost to the testing because we have to staff that with personnel. But but once you're selected, then you go to your medical exams, your drug screening, yeah. uh, all that. That all adds up. And then once they're hired, you, you give them a starter set of uniforms and personal protective equipment. And then, of course, you pay them. Our recruits get paid. And then there's training offices. So, yeah, it, does, it, is, uh, it is several thousand dollars per, per, per student just to get them for the first three months. Mm -hmm. And then once they're on the field, you know, for the first six months, you know, we're still, uh, we have people who we have to bring in as training officers with them, which often results in them being backfilled oh, on overtime. Right, right. So, yeah, no, there are costs. We, uh, we do make a significant investment. That's why we do try to get everybody through. Yeah, we do, you know, hope to keep them. Yep. Um, you mentioned equipment. What, what about, um, and I think this, this came up, and I was looking at my notes from last year, some of the personal um, sort of protective equipment that our EM, EMTs don't have as part of their regular uniform. Can you talk a little bit about the needs, just briefly about the needs of some of our EMTs? Because you've got your big yellow jacket on. Yep. And, uh, and often going into, you could be going into a crisis event that can be dangerous for our first responders. Can you talk a little bit about the protective gear that you uh, may need for your uh, EMTs? Sure. We have, so the, the, <clears throat> the outer gear is one thing. A lot of that's meant for obviously weather, rain, whatever storms. Uh, there's different liners there. And so that's mostly environmental, right, for storms, blizzards. Mm -hmm. the, then you have uh, Helmets that are issued for routine standbys. Well, we worried about me the breaking glass or things coming down on you or when you're operating around a mode vehicle accident or maybe a bus that's on its side. We issue gloves, boots, other equipment there. We have, it's not really turnout gear in the sense that fire turnout gear, but it's a, it is a, a high quality one that's got quilted linings in it that does protect you around glass and cutting if you're operating in a dangerous scene. It also has a, a membrane on it that protects you from bloodborne pathogens. We also, uh, in every truck we issue, obviously, gloves, masks, and we fit test all the personnel to see which size mask you should be wearing, uh, whether it's protecting you in flu season or if you're worried about uh, uh, some sort of uh, you know, uh, release, or if you're worried about an infectious disease. We issue uh, the uh, Scott, uh, it's an AV2000 face piece, which we can put a canister on, or which filters out um, riot agents. It filters out uh, dangerous chemicals such as uh, nerve agent poisoning. We do train all our people in the use of that and the safe procedure for putting it on. We do provide uh, personal body armor to all of our personnel. Even the recruits, once they come in, we size them and we start the order there uh, because it takes a little bit to have those uh, um, uh, sets of body armor manufactured. They're typically good for at least five years and that's when the, uh, uh, the bodies that certify them recommend that we change them out. So about every year we're changing out about a third of our uh, personal issue body armor. That body armor that we issue right now is uh, not the same as what you would see uh, the SWAT officers or somebody have. It's similar to what the patrolman on the beat has. It's something that they can wear underneath their uh, uniform shirt, or if they prefer, they can wear it in a uh, outer carrier. Uh, we issue it to personnel. They are currently not required to wear it routinely. Many well but many do, and in the certain situations where they certainly would, especially where we're uh, assisting the police with uh, some operations. In a response to a lot of concerns that came up after what we saw at uh, Las Vegas, uh, the Pulse nightclub, or places where long guns are being used for mass shootings in urban areas, there was a lot of concerns that the body armor that we issue, and frankly with the what are issued to patrolmen is inadequate to stop, you know, military grade rounds like that. You know, when you see M4s or AK-47s in use. So with that, we went out and uh, we worked. The union raised a lot of concerns about that, and we certainly wanted to be able to protect them in those situations. We 
We got approval from uh, the Executive Office of Public Health uh, to expend uh, $100,000 this fiscal year, and we have placed uh, an order, and we do expect to get it in this month, uh, a number of sets of higher level body armor. Uh, the higher level stuff is heavier. Uh, it would, would be worn over your other equipment. And so instead of that being uh, personally issued, our plan is to put uh, complete sets, a couple of complete sets in every unit, and also have the supervisors and our special response units to carry extra sets as well. Along with that is a Kevlar, and I'm not the expert of this, level three, level four helmet, which would be sufficient to protect you, a ballistic helmet from, from that type of round. Now, having said that, that's not because I expect our personnel to be the first ones through the door when someone's firing a semi-automatic rifle. It's, we really are putting it out just like a lot of our PPE because as we've seen around the world, sometimes the hot zone comes to you. You know, you weren't, uh, the folks in Paris that we brought over here, we talked to, they weren't anticipating, you know, what they saw at uh, the Bataclan nightclub there when everybody get pinned down while well, even the, the the regular police had a call for special units to come in to be able to combat that type of firepower. But even if you are in the vicinity there, you want to have the best level of protection available. So our, our goal is to uh, place it in the ambulances uh, re really by the end of this this fiscal year, and we do expect to have it in. And uh, so we'll be able to uh, basically grab it off the shelf if we have to go to that level of protection. But again, any, any training about how we would be, uh, would be under uh, you know, the, the, the protection of the Boston Police Department. Great, thank you, Chief. Thank you, and we've been joined by Councilor Lydia Edwards. Uh, Councilor Frank Baker has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, Chief. Um, did you know it was, we were going to schedule this during EMS week? That's pretty good planning on your part, I think. It, it seems to happen almost every year. Nice, you know, yeah. nice. Um, <laughs> so Council O'Malley asked a lot of about the, the training facility and yep. your other facilities, so I'm glad that, that we're working towards that. Can you talk a little bit about, a little, like, dig in a little more about um, the partnership with the best team in BPD? So what, like, like what, what is your role there? I mean, I don't know your role when you show up on a scene, but, but once a person, that you have the person not in custody, but in your ambulance or whatever, what, what happens from there? Can you talk about those interactions a bit? No, absolutely. When we, when we have uh, in, encounter patients, either they're emotionally disturbed person or, uh, or, they, or they have a diagnosed mental illness, and maybe the family's calling because uh, their 19-year-old son refuses to take his medication, he, he, he's acting out. We, there isn't much that uh, EMTs working in a licensed ambulance service can do really other than to transport them to an emergency room. So do you because transport transport, and then notify the best team, or, or how, does that, how does that interaction happen, maybe is what I'm asking. Oh, okay, yeah. So absent them, we would have to uh, really try to convince them to go if we thought that they were, you know, exhibiting signs that they were either out of control or, or they had issues where they could be a threat, a threat to themselves or to others, or, or, and we really try to get them to go. Uh, to go to detox? To go to the hospital. To the hospital. We, we, have to go, okay. we, we have to go, we have to transport. Right now, we can only transport to our emergency rooms. Like, we can't transport uh, uh, e even to a psychiatric facility right now. Not, that's not the way uh, emergency services are are permitted Everything in the state. Everything is triaged through the, yeah. the emergency room. Yeah, if someone's being transferred from, uh, say, Boston Medical Center to, uh, to, a, to a psychiatric facility, a lot of times that'll be, uh, somebody will be transported by a, uh, a, a private ambulance company, because once they've already maybe been cleared or, or what have you. So for right now, it's, uh, it's pretty much our, our options are in the emergency room. With the best team and with the uh, the ability to use them, there's a couple of different things. One, they may be able to, they can take somebody with, with the police to a different facility, especially if it's some place where it is appropriate for them to go to, where, they, where they're not gonna be brought there and the, that facility's gonna immediately say, hey, we don't wanna see this guy until he's medically cleared, which means now they're calling us to come back and take him to a hospital, or they're, they're gonna bring him in. 
Now, the best team where there are uh, people that are, have a lot more training in dealing with psychiatric emergencies, even if they're going to take them to the hospital, men, maybe they could just take them along uh, with, with the police as well. Uh, also, our, one of our hopes is that that may be able to help us with situations where uh, we wouldn't have to rely on taking somebody against their will, forcibly restraining them to do that. I mean, that's, that's the least enjoyable part of our job. Sometimes we have to do it. Uh, but the idea was that if sometimes if you have maybe a clinician who's uh, better off at handling that or to, to give that a try. So to this point, we've just, it's mostly been making our people aware that that asset was out there. Because for the longest time, it was like one officer that worked, I think, the evening shift in B2. So you, your chances of like, getting that unit available to assist mm -hmm. you was pretty rare. You know, now that uh, they're working uh, uh, more shifts, more hours, and we're starting to see them in different parts of the city, you know, we can, because our dispatch is co-located with police dispatch, we can just make a request to them and say, like, hey, do you have a unit with the best team on? When that call comes in. Yeah, when that call comes in or when our personnel get to the scene and say, hey, you know, we could maybe get this person to go. Or we get there and we find a person who is competent. They don't seem under the influence or impacted by anything, and they meet the criteria to be able to refuse transport. But, you know, the family's insisting something else is going on, and they really, we really want to try to get this guy or girl to go to the hospital. The best team can come in. I mean, they, they have the legal authority to issue an emergency section 12 section, and 13. Mm -hmm. And we've used that. So those, so those are for mental illness, the, the section 12? For mental illness, yeah, or for, uh, or for even just, or, and not just that, if we get somebody when it's four degrees out, who's living on the street, doesn't want to go, yeah. but they're competent, legally they can refuse. Uh, but given the surroundings, a few different things, sometimes that we've notified the best team, even before they're with the police, and they'll come in and, you know, they can, they can do a section which makes it a little bit easier to force the person then so, to go. So are you guys involved in Section 35s at all? No, not directly. I know that's uh, being done with, uh, with the specialty court and yeah. with uh, the BPD that have been, you know, doing that a bit more. One, to try to, you know, really, another tool to try to get people into treatment, try to keep them alive long enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully move on into, like, transitional and supportive yeah. care. And, and one of the other sections that you talked about was an 11 and 12? I think it was a, section, 12, 12, section, section 12. Section 12 and then 35. And so 12 is for just... 12 is 12 the emergency one. They used to call it a pink paper. You know, is that, that could be for emergency hospitalization. It could be for mental illness, but it could be for substance. Yeah. It could be for somebody who, uh, you know, they, they, they find that, uh, you know, uh, maybe a, a crazy hoarder situation where, but there's no food in that play and the person's where they'd be like, we got to get you some place. You know, it's unhealthy yeah. here. There's, but I don't want to get into yeah, the details. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> and, and okay, uh, along, kind of along those same lines, you, you in in here it's talking about uh, human trafficking and how EMS interacts with with people that are being trafficked. Can you can you explain to me a, a bit about um, maybe where that's happening and what what do you do in that situation when you've identified someone that's been trafficked like what do you have of it what does ems have available to you well what we have available right now certainly is to uh one raising our awareness of it the potential of it and to know that it could be uh younger persons it could be older persons a lot of them uh, could be people who are uh, maybe recent immigrants who are maybe afraid to go to authorities who are afraid that if I report this or even complain about this, I could be, uh, you know, putting myself on a uh, potential hot seat to get, you know, detained or, or deported. Or maybe somebody who's controlling them, who's trafficking them, is giving them that impression and is kind of holding that over them to keep them quiet. We're, I mean, we're, we, do, we do calls everywhere, whether it's in shelters, hotels, subways, um, private homes. And th 
one is to recognize that could be happening anywhere, whether it's, you know, forced servitude, whether it's... And is, your people are trained to identify... They're, they're getting, that. yes, we're getting trained to identify that, but also even just trained to suspect it, you know, to be, you know, a little bit sus yeah. suspicious, whether, whether again, some of child abuse or elder neglect, you know, we're, that's sort of ingrained in the people to, to, to look for that. You know, it's when you go to an apartment and there's a bunch of little kids running around and the screens are down, the sofa's up against it, there's no window guards to talk to people about that, to know that there's low cost um, right. options for that. Would you like somebody to come and see you? But and again, it's, uh, uh, I know I digress a little bit, but that's become so ingrained in our people, they re routinely think of things like that. The goal here is to get them to uh, suspect uh, the, uh, the human trafficking is, go is, is out there and that we, if we suspect it at all, that we should report it. We can report it to the hospital once we get people there, hopefully to make it safe, but also report it to uh, law enforcement. Okay. And last question, Chief, if you can explain to me a little bit about your chargeback system. How, do, how does that happen? Um, so do we charge insurance companies? Are we charging mass health? Do we... Do we do that operation in-house? Can you, this is probably a question for you, Laura, I don't, I don't know. Either one happy, yeah, well, we, we, we do. Whoever wants to answer. Yeah, well, sure, we, we can tandem it too, but we have a, uh, uh, we, we do bill for our, our services, for our mm -hmm. transport, similar as I think every licensed uh, ambulance service in the Commonwealth, the ones that are either doing contract work for a city and town, or if it's a, uh, Municipal police are fire based. They, I, I do believe they all do it. I mean, some rural parts of New England, I know I, they have volunteer systems, but I even think there yeah, they have like subscriber fees. So, so if you're just out on a regular run, do you like you're not submitting an in invoice to the city of Boston? I was that's just part of our operating costs. Oh, no, 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 no. We we bill, we we, we basically we bill the patient, and uh, and by saying we bill the patient, uh, in 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 most cases, it's their insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, we submit a bill. We we use a uh, we contract out with a private that company does all the that does the ambulance, that does medical building, uh, building which is uh, which is complicated. You know, you know, trying to make sure we meeting all the uh, the, the HIPAA requirements, make sure we're uh, in conformance with all the uh, uh, CMS billing codes and insurance requirements. So so. Is, is there a gap in between our bill, billing and what your budget is? Like, what or what is that gap? Sure, I think we anticipate this year it's gonna be on order of about, the, well, not just billing, but, but the projected cost for our budget this year is about $57 million. And that would call for a subsidy from the city of Boston yeah. of about 18, and then, what, so million. out of the out of the fifty-seven, what are we what are we billing? What's the number for for what we actually get reimbursed through Mass Health and private insurance companies? Okay, we anticipate this year that it's going to be thirty-six. Seven. Thirty-six million. I think it's thirty-seven. Thirty-seven million, Chief. Thirty-seven. Million. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Wrong page. Thank you, Chief, yes. and, and yeah. for everything you and, and, and your people do for the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Council CMO. And I just wanted to echo what Councillor Baker said. I think we have the best um, EMS division in the country. And I just want to say thank you to, to you, Chief, and, and to Laura as well. Um, I had a couple questions, Chief. I know you talked about the success of the um, EMT, uh, certified EMT. Uh, program, um, and you said the cost was about seven hundred dollars for someone to take that course. Yeah, I believe it's about seven fifty now. And then uh, books. Is if someone doesn't have the money for the course, um, are there any options for that person to uh, still take the course? You know, they might want to be a EMS. They they might want to be in this field, but. You know, certainly we wouldn't want $700 to be the reason that they couldn't get into this field. Is there any other options for some dedicated young person that wants to really be certified? Well, up, up until now, there really 
wasn't because like so we were, we were constrained that we have to pay our instructors and you know pay the state examiners when they come in to conduct the, uh, the examination and we have to buy books and we do consume some materials when we're doing training so it was it was kind of difficult to to do that we used to uh you give people time to make a down payment then come in but payment was supposed to be received uh, before you know the class started in order to ensure the seat now with this program that the city is sponsoring for for us up to 30 people there that tuition would be completely paid for okay. by them which is terrific we've had i mentioned earlier um the, the union that represents uh, 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 the EMTs and paramedics, the BPPA EMS division, they have sponsored uh, uh, all the family. Uh, uh, there's been different groups have approached them, and they've sponsored a scholarship. Or uh, other people have come forward before and say, hey, I'd like to donate. Would it be good? We've, we've directed that. We've suggested that to people. Hey, maybe sponsor somebody. So every now and then, we would get something like that, and we would uh, use that to help out somebody. But you know, the, this this opportunity we have now with the Office of Workforce Development is a, uh, a welcome addition. Thank you, Chief. Um, I had the opportunity during that anti-gun violence um, rally up at the Boston Commons several, maybe two months ago, a month and a half ago, to, to visit and tour the command truck center that was, that was off the, off the uh, Boston Common. Um, can you give a little bit of um, background on, on the purpose of the command center, what does a command center do in such a situation? I know you have one at the Boston Marathon, but what type of um, services would that command center play? Well, sure. Uh, command posts, command centers are, are one, one, they're good for directing operations at, at a particular event, and also for coordinating resources at a particular event. Uh, the vehicle that, that that you're speaking of there was was sort of had dual purpose that day. It's a, uh, uh, I think the technical word is a MAB, mobile ambulance bus, mm -hmm. that w was purchased with uh, uh, federal UAC dollars in conjunction through uh, the city of Boston here, through its UAC, through uh, OEM. Uh, we spec that out uh, several years ago. That has the ability to uh, carry, Oh, I forget the exact number of uh, personnel. It, uh, it, it depends on their acuity. We could, uh, we have stretch of space on there for uh, 20 plus personnel. We have the ability to uh, ratchet down and secure to the floor multiple patients in wheelchairs. So that gives us the ability to help uh, if we had to evacuate, say, a skilled nursing facility, mm -hmm. or if there was an emergent evacuation, we had to uh, transfer large groups of persons or redistribute them beyond uh, the region I get them out of Boston uh, bring them somewhere else we but we've used it on uh, on events where we've had multiple people right now with say minor complaints where we get them out of the elements we get them in we can examine them in there we have medical equipment in there we can do EKGs on them and uh, prioritize them for transport uh, one of the busy ev events believe it or not we used them for was Two years ago when the Patriots uh, had that Super Bowl celebration, it was parked out in the back of this building, and probably the worst kept secret in town was that the players were gonna hang around the back of City Hall there. So we wound up with a pretty good crowd of mostly intoxicated underage uh, people. Well, unfortunately, when they're falling down and stuff, you have to really check them out for head injuries or co-ingestions or anything else. So we, we did, uh, a lot of them we just pulled in there to get them. If you recall, the weather was horrible that day. And that kind of became a mobile clinic where we could decide who could we, who could be discharged, uh, who had to be transported, you know, who could be reunited with family. But again, that saved uh, transports to some hospitals. But it also had helped us with uh, uh, being able to uh, triage patients and hold them until we could get ambulances in and not pull ambulances out of you know, East Boston and I'd parked to come down to a, a rally here that helped us manage our caseload that day. Okay. Chief, I know in the, um, some of the documents as it relates to the EMS station study, 
um, the studies underway, the South Boston uh, seaport. Yes. Can you give a little bit of a, a little bit of background information on that, please? Uh, yes, Council. We we had made uh, a request of the city several years ago because when the seaport district, or back when the city called it the uh, innovation area, right, the uh, was was growing. Uh, we we talked before about our call volume going up before it was going up maybe two percent a year, which doesn't seem like much, but once you're over 100,000, it is, and transport's going up just a little bit less than that. And that was more of the historical growth across the city the last several years. About 14 years ago, until maybe uh, a few years ago, look at how far back do we look on the first, uh, on the seaport, when we first looked. I think we were looking back in 2003. Yeah, so from 2003 until a couple of years ago, in, in your you're a resident of Southie Council, so you know. I mean, that was like, it was a ghost town at night. Yeah. But everyone knows what it's developed into now. But even 2003 on, we started to see like double digit growth and calls down there. We were like in 14% growth and improvement, which was, I mean, not improvement, <laughs> got demand for services down there. And one was to try to get extra trucks on, which we did. But another thing was like, we were trying to get a station down in there somewhere. So we, we had approached uh, the city about it, and I know about then the BRA, now the BPDA, and, and others are, have that on their radar. Mm -hmm. What the city did two years ago was they, they funded a study to do a needs assessment, and they started looking at uh, various possibilities down there. One was to uh, build a station solo for EMS on an existing piece of city property down there. Another one was to build it in conjunction with uh, maybe other agencies, police, fire, mm -hmm. or transportation, somebody else similar to what's going on in uh, East Boston, Eagle Square. I mean, they, what they did was they scoped out a bunch of potential ways to do it. But then beyond that, they also looked at several other cities where it was done with part of private development, where if somebody's building an office building or mixed use or whatever, they would take a corner of one floor and put a fire bay in there mm -hmm. or put two ambulance bays in there. And so what they did in this study was they tried to come up with estimates what some of that would cost uh, and show best case, uh, best cases for uh, of, of what that's looked like in other cities. And they've you know, presented that back to uh, property management of the city. So hopefully then uh, that'll give some direction. What's the best way to go? What's the most bang for the buck? What's the most efficient going mm -hmm. forward? Right. I, I I see the building there, the Shafaro, Don Shafaro's building there on Oliver off of Franklin Street with the firehouse and the EMS presence yeah. there. Um, but I, I do agree with you. I, I am concerned down in the South Boston waterfront um, you know, with the with the high volume of traffic, I'd love eventually to see a police, fire, EMS, um, state of the art um, building there. That you know, the, as, as you mentioned, the neighborhood's growing so fast, and I am concerned if there was a public safety um, problem or hazard um, that it would be difficult for our first responders to get in there. But my long-term plan is to see a, a police, fire, EMS major presence in that in that area as well but again i just wanted to say chief um thank you for um, your leadership for so many years in the city and we're we're proud to have you and you're doing an excellent job thank you council thank you Councilor mccarthy thank you very much uh mr chair uh chief welcome welcome staff everybody um you know I, i've always been a tremendous fan of uh, the men and women in brown so it doesn't really uh, go as a shock uh, that I'm going to tell you congratulations on yet you know continuing just a, a stellar reputation for yourself obviously chief but your entire staff and every man and women who work for you um, you're an incredible organization uh, and, and definitely a, a, an incredible benefit to the city of Boston um, I just have a couple questions that some a lot of the questions I have are around locations and operations that's kind of the background that I have anyway. <clears throat> My concern uh, for you, and we've talked about this, uh, I talk about it with uh, Commissioner Evans as well as Commissioner Finn, 
The biggest complaint we get uh, as a district city council is traffic and traffic congestion. Um, your locations and your operations facilities concern me. Um, I think they concern you too. You'd like to be everywhere, but you certainly can't. Um, is there a strategic plan to, to figure out exactly and to uh, Council Flint's point, you know, we have a brand new, uh, brand new neighborhood coming in the waterfront now uh, in the South Boston waterfront and, um, you know, we had a, a, a hearing uh, last week about concurrent jurisdiction as you're aware, well aware of. Um, is there a strategic plan in place of where we should be uh, regarding uh, response times and things like that? Currently, I wouldn't say there's a, a you know a, an updated strategic plan, but we did uh, a f several years ago when we did update it, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the change of administrations as well, where we made recommendations for right. where we would like to see <coughs> garages, you know, stations where we can move our trucks out of. When and, and you know they're busy, so most of them aren't going back sitting there and watching the Celtics playoff game there. They're usually out somewhere else and trying to clear out of a hospital and we're grabbing them, you know, the Hyde Park truck, they're, they're coming out of the Brigham, you know, and they're, now we move somebody else out to cover them in the meantime, but hey, at least they get Hyde Park Station. They can get in, maybe get out of the rain, use the facilities, heat up something as well too, because anybody has access to the stations, you know, using the COD key system. So, you know, having that, that station out in Hyde Park was a, was a big thing when I when I when I worked out that way, uh, our one of our ambulance that changed out of um, across from the old Boston City Hospital, our garage then, which is now healthcare for the homeless. You picked up that truck there, and you drove out to Clary Square, you parked outside the police station, and uh, you could go inside there if you wanted to get out of the truck. So I mean, there's been improvements, but you know it's not everywhere. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, I'm sorry, one of the places we made a recommendation was uh, certainly the seaport. Uh, another one we made uh, recommendations in Harvard's master plan for, for developing what they're doing over there to include some sort of uh, garage or facility for uh, EMS in Brighton because we're right now we were at basically a tenant at will. We get a pretty good deal from them for the facility we're renting from Harvard right now on McDonald Way off of Everett Street. We've run two ambulances out of there. We store some disaster equipment there for public health preparedness. But if if they decide that's gonna be the next whatever building, we'll probably get some sufficient notice, but probably not enough or a place to go. Um, so we have, we, we did, we have, we do have all those needs documented as far as, uh, uh, but they could probably be updated. Uh, Rosendale was another one, council, mm -hmm. where we, right now, ML 17, uh, they change out of our facility on River Street, Mattapan, yep. and then they travel back to, uh, yeah. to Rosendale. Down Cummings, yep. Yeah, and which is, it helps, <clears throat> but that, that, that shift change time of day, they're, they're moving right. back and forth. Similar to our ML 12, which is a zone impact truck that normally posts up around Franklin Park, you know, we've, we've made recommendations, say, if there's any building going on back where Pox is, inside Franklin Park, you know, anywhere we might jump on where another city department is building, I, I just, there's more economies of scale to maybe jump in when somebody else is, is, is building, because freestanding costs a bit of money. But, we, but if you're already bringing in Bonet, you're bringing in other city services there, uh, similar to when we linked up with DPW, oh, right. in, my oh yeah, there and uh, when they built a facility in Fields Corner in Dorchester, that was uh, that's you know stood the test of time. That's been good yeah. because we have you know connections, data lines, so we can pull right over from the police station. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, the truck A18 has got a nice spot over there. That's where I used to uh, do snow operations. So got a lot of friends over there, um, and I know that just the fact that you said renting from Harvard. There's a couple of eyes that popped open, including my two uh, <laughs> colleagues who are here. Uh, uh, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Sabri George uh, are doing a, a hearing in a couple of weeks regarding uh, the pilot. So um, maybe we can figure out why we're spending money renting to, from Harvard. That's a whole other. That's a whole other can of worms. The, my last question actually is kind of a silly one, but I've been curious ever since we had the um, uh, the banquet at the Venezia. 
So yes. they had the old, they had the PowerPoint, which was really funny. They were showing a lot of the old pictures with guys with giant, you know, froze and stashes. <laughs> and then they showed an old truck, and everybody booed. What was that all about? Do you remember, like, there was one truck they showed, and I don't know if it was not attached or something. It was like, oh, and I and I walked out of there thinking, what, what's the? Yeah, well, fortunately, it wasn't that old. Uh, it was uh, back, so we got, after the late 90s, we, we got away from the ambulance boxes that were mount on, mounted on pickup truck frames because some of those we were lucky to get two years out of. We would have frames cracking. You know, we, you know, we punished them a little bit on city streets driving around, and the trucks were heavy. They carried a lot of uh, equipment, and they were right, right, right at the GVW limit when you took them delivery off the factory floor, and between suspensions and transmissions and everything, we, they, they tended to be nightmares. Back in 2003, I think it was, we went to a, a medium-duty truck, the, the Chevy, uh, I think it was the 4500 uh, GMC, which proved to be a, a dependable platform for us. The brakes would last way better because they're the same type of truck you would put a, a dump truck on or mm -hmm. something else on. Uh, so the, the cooling, the engine, the transmission, the brakes, everything held up much better. It was heavy duty. Uh, unfortunately, they, they tend to ride like a dump truck. And so what we had to do to, uh, we went through different iterations over years with different suspensions, velvet rides, air rides, different ones. And we would, so we, we, we would get a uh, procurement of ambulances in and we would finally get uh, the suspension the way we wanted it. And then the next year they'd stop making that line of truck or something else. So a couple of years ago, GM just dropped that line. It was, there used to be a waiting list for it. I don't know why they dropped it, but they dropped that line because we finally got the bugs figured out of that model. And we went to an uh, international, uh, which was another medium duty truck, which was proved to be pretty unforgiving for the ride. And not so much the back, we, we, well, yeah, the back too. But we, we, did, we, we, we tinkered with that, we tried to get that squared away. But the creature comforts for the crew who were living in it for, that was their office in between calls, right? right. It, was, it was pretty spartan. Roll down windows, uh, uh, not much creature comforts at all in there. Because now if you go out, you can go out now these days and buy a new Ford or whatever pickup truck that rides like a Cadillac, you know, that has, you know, multi-position seats and, uh, you know, uh, all the bells and whistles. And finally, the pickup trucks did catch up with that. And two years ago, we, we developed a, uh, an ambulance uh, working group with union membership, management, mechanics. We went out, did the specs all over, and we tested out a few of the trucks. And currently now it's the Ford F450, which has a higher rated GVW. It will take, and we, we downsized the box. The trucks look big, but the box we put on them is maybe, maybe about a foot less. So to fit on that, so we've downsized the back of the truck a little bit. We went with a lighter box, and uh, you know, from all, and we went with a, uh, it's called a liquid spring suspension, which dumps down a little bit when you open the doors. So you're making, the biggest thing there was making the crew's safety and comfort improved. So that's why you heard the big groan. No, because when you have to switch out of one of the newer trucks to go into a spare because it's in for PM or needs some work, whatever, uh, you miss your new truck. So that's, that's what it was. All right. Yeah, we groaned when the Parks Department went to Ford Contours, too. They lasted for like two years. <laughs> so thanks very much again for everything you guys do. Oh. And uh, when, when, when we uh, start the, the planning for new facilities, uh, whether it's training or offices themselves, I'll be, uh, I'll be on board with that without a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you, Chief. Obviously, uh, EMS has had a great working relationship with the Council uh, over the years. I actually served as Council President when uh, we were able to deliver Group 4 uh, a, uh, a much well-deserved benefit to, to you and to your membership uh, for the hard work that you guys do so. Um, and appreciate it working alongside with you and your team when we were able to get that done for you. Um, and obviously, there was a period of time when my kids were a lot younger. I thought I was your best customer for a while. Uh, yeah. It was orange mm -hmm. lights coming to 
my house pretty regularly, uh, particularly with the twins. But um, always very professional and uh, always great to see them. Uh, and you hear that a lot from folks across the city. Anytime they, they dial 911 and oftentimes they, they don't care if it's orange lights or blue lights or red lights. They just, they, they're in, in, in need of assistance and, uh, and oftentimes uh, you and your crew are uh, right on the spot. And in many instances, sometimes the first guy's there. So um, appreciate that, that effort. Um, just going through the budget, I want to take a peek at the special ops. You had 786 events in 2017. Are you on par to be at the same or more in 2018? Yeah, I, it, it's been, that's been growing every that's year. Significant. So yeah. I, I wouldn't, I, I would anticipate that's probably going to grow. <clears throat> and, and, and to have your folks there, that I assume that is that paid by the event organizers or is it some of it, um, I guess gratis as a, as, a, as a service or benefit to, to the residents from our city? You know, many of the smaller ones, and I'll give you an example. Like yesterday, you had the, that Adidas event down where they shut down Child Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a, that was a detail. The detail rate's a little bit less than over time. It's a negotiated thing. So we, we build it. They, they go in front of a special events group for the city, just like other departments. And there's a regulation and a public health board that where we, where we can we don't we don't force them to hire us, but we make recommendations. We have to at least review your plan, and if it's and it's uh, uh, a lot of ones are required. For example, uh, like schoolboy football games, you have to have an EMT on scene. Uh, uh, boxing events, you have to have an yeah. ambulance. Yeah. Uh, there's there, there are some that are required by the vendor. Uh, that are some that are required uh, uh, by the city. We say like, hey, you want to have whatever festival out here in City Hall Plaza, you have to. Uh, Hire an ambulance for it. Now they make some. They even scale up. You said you might, you know, if we come in and make a recommendation that we may need uh, this is a a bike race the city sponsoring, then uh, or allowing that we have to have some EMTs on bikes. So we maybe need a uh, put a medical tent somewhere because of that halfway point last year we get killed with people overcome by heat. So we want to make sure we plan appropriately. So we go in and we make recommendations and. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, it's if they want to get their permit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have to get a, a sign off on it. Gotcha. Very good. But but there are some events where uh, obviously the uh, yeah, a lot of our senior events. I see you guys. Yeah, a lot of senior events there yeah. and stuff. Like we don't build the elderly commission. Right. You know, it's just sort of expected right. that we'll do yeah. that when we get the request from their commissioner, right. or uh, or a lot of the parades, like you know, the Dodge the Day Parade, uh, same, you know, mm -hmm. large civic celebrations, uh, the Caribbean Parade. Uh, those are, uh, right. you know, funded for our regular and, operational budget. And uh, it never feels any type of, a, any time you're in a senior event, there's always some incident. There could be someone having difficulty walking, they might have, uh, might have been choking on something, or might have been on the dance floor at Chairman Siomo a little longer than they probably anticipated, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> having you guys there uh, rendering assistance has been great and very comforting to, to our seniors. Um, fleet management on the fleet side, um, how many vehicles and how old are they and how many hours on the engines? They actually track that and I could, I could produce a spreadsheet yeah, on that. Through, yeah, yeah, through the but, chair. But we do the, a, yeah. Yes, we do the model yeah. years, the miles where they're assigned, yeah. whether they're primary or they're reserved, gotcha. or if they're the ones that we just kind of save for driver training right. that are next scheduled to go. Gotcha. So we do, we do rate them based on the hours. Right. So through the chair, like if you would mind if I can just get the, the, the number of ambulances that we have and or EMS vehicles yep. uh, and uh, get a sense as to what their engine hours are. I know there was a period of time, not this administration, previous administration, there was significant, um, I guess, divestment, if you will, uh, not keeping up, particularly with our fire department. Mm -hmm. Not sure whether or not that was the same trend for EMS, but um, there didn't seem to be a lot of love for, for our, our firefighters, not only just their apparatus, but also the condition of, of their firehouses. So I want to make sure that we're on the right trajectory with respect to, to your department, your vehicles, um, service, engine hours, things of that nature. So, so if you could furnish that to the chair, that would be great. Uh, my favorite topic every year is Bragdon Street. I guess where are we on that? Um, I happen to like that location. It's the epicenter of the city. I'd love the city to, to, to purchase that building. Um, not sure where we are in terms of the, the commitment to Bragdon Street, but every year we kind of sort of like the lease starts to wind down and there was some talk about going maybe somewhere else to build sort of the state-of-the-art campus. I'd love for us to, the infrastructure's there, the telecommunication piece is there. It's literally right in the epicenter, uh, close to police and fire headquarters, as well as close to the, one of the best hospitals in the world with our city hospital. But 
there's always some trend trying to pull it out and go way out to further out to southwest Boston. And I just want to make sure that we're committed mm -hmm. to that site and or either purchase the building or let's lock in for a long-term deal at Bragdon Street so we have that command center in intact. Yeah, um, we're, I know we're under lease agreement right now. I think it was a three-year lease because I think all our ones are, uh, most of them are terms like that, but I think we're either in the second year or we're about to go in the second. I think we just renewed it last year because okay. I know, they, uh, you know the, the rates went up. Uh, I'm not personally familiar. I think the city did uh, take a look at uh, some of the possibilities for purchase. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if they were in the same okay. ballpark when it came to negotiations around this because the, the city's EOC is currently located there as well. So, you know, they have a, a dog in the fight, a voice in it as well. And uh, I know uh, uh, Director Fielding was, you know, trying to make her concerns about that because she wouldn't want to necessarily get that spot up after out outfitting it. And there was some conversations with the ownership, and I'm not sure where that went, but I think okay. the, the offset of that was, or the offshoot of that was that they, the parties agreed to enter into another three-year okay. lease period. All right, yeah, if I can just get an update on that, or I can maybe reach out to someone in your department. And then just finally, uh, uh, with respect to the opioid crisis, and something I'm continuing to work on, and maybe enlist your help, or at least get your opinion on it, is I, I believe that uh, when um, men and women that work for you, when they administer Narcan, I think that that should be a mandatory reporting situation. I, I understand HIPAA, but I think that should be a mandatory reporting situation. I also think it should be a mandatory transport to the hospital. And what we're seeing is that we'll have an overdose mm -hmm. and 911s get called and you guys, not just you, but I've seen the police do it. I've sure. seen the fire department do it. They administer Narcan. Whoever gets there first is on it. They're administering Narcan. The individual jumps up like Jack and the Beanstalk, right, uh, right out of Jack in the Box. And before you guys even kind of get a, a sense as to getting the person's name and address, the person's like walking away down the street. Nope, I'm good, I'm all set, thank you. They, or they start, they'll start wrestling with you for a while, they come to their senses and then, and, and my concern is that the loved ones, you know, the spouse, the family member, the parent, no one has any idea that that event occurred. That was an overdose, but for the fact of you guys showing up, that person would have died. Mm -hmm. You administer Narcan and we, collectively, we allow the person just to get up and to walk away and we don't get to say anything to anybody about it at all. And I find that very problematic. I think that there should be a policy and I'm, I'm chasing down whether or not it makes sense to have it by ordinance, but the minute that we, the city, we administer uh, that life-saving mechanism, that should, that, should that should be accompanied by an automatic transport for evaluation and or that's our shot to maybe get this person into treatment and recovery. Uh, now we spend lots of time with fending off people that want to provide locations for people to to to, to shoot up heroin and, and fentanyl, but we don't want to turn around and take the person that actually just overdosed from those substances and transport them uh, to the hospital and notify a, a, a loved one or a next of kin so that the family at least has uh, some knowledge of the event and they can maybe rally around that individual for treatment and recovery. I just I know we're in the life-saving business. I understand the HIPAA piece of it, but I got a big problem with you know us um, expending resources, administering Narcan, and then the individual just gets up and walks away, and no one, no one in that person's family has any idea what the heck just happened on pick a street, mm -hmm. it ha and it happens every day. So uh, I don't know whether that you have an opinion on it or you want to work together on it, but I just I'm of the opinion that there should be mandatory reporting and mandatory hospitalization. We do <clears throat> really try to get all those cases of suspected narcotic-related illnesses to go to be transported. Historically, over the years, when we look back, they had a very high correlation with that. The, the majority did go. We got them to go. Uh, some communities, uh, it's been really going the other way. Uh, we started to take a look at it uh, the last couple of months of last year, and I thought when we did a quick review of some of the NRI that we had that we cleared with either somebody refusing was, uh, you know, and sometimes some, some areas we were seeing like almost 13%, which wasn't, which wasn't the case uh, years back, and which kind of leaves us trying to figure out why is that happening. Uh, because if somebody's, you know, completely competent, like right now, we can't 
unless they made a threat that they were trying to kill themselves or somebody else or somebody else can corroborate mm -hmm. that, we typically can't force them to go. A lot of the patients and even a lot of the people that we did transport. Let me ask you just, so why, yeah. why can't you force them to go? If, the, if they're competent, they're, they're, they're of age, they're, uh, they don't have uh, signs of any other injury or any other congest, they know the name. The the, date, I, but arguably they, they were just dead, right? You, you brought them back from yeah. being dead. I think that that should trigger, you gotta come, you gotta come, you know, you gotta get on the gurney and you gotta come downtown and we gotta, I don't, I don't, and, I, and so my, sure. I, I'm, I'm trying, I to, I'm, I'm troubled with trying to find that mechanism. So how can the council play that role, working with the administration and our public safety and our public health officials to, to make that a mandatory situation where you are lights out, but for not can, and and I, and I used it. There was that the show. Um, I think it was it was a nine one one. There was they had the cameras were were were, um, were on your buses a couple a couple years ago. Yes, yes. It yeah. was a kid that had grew up with uh, with my son that um, was overdosed, you brought him back, he got up, literally walked away, refused any further treatment. The first time his family and, and loved ones realized that he had that type of event was when they, when they viewed six, that six months or eight oh. months later when the show, when they viewed the show, they were aghast. Had yeah. no, they had no idea, one, that he was out and about, and two, that he was involved in, at, at that level. Um, kid was gone. You guys save him. His family finds out six months later when it, when it airs. So I, and I understand it. I just, where's that mechanism by which we can collectively make sure that that's a transport to the hospital and notification to next to kin and loved ones so that we can jump on this thing. You know. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine the notification would be uh, probably either uh, would, would require a change in either you know regulations or, or law or something that that would allow us gotcha. to do that. Gotcha. And I know I've exhausted my time. I appreciate you. Your patience. I, I had my the last question, which I can wait for another round, is just around. Uh, I was on the on the response times. Traffic is at an all time. It, no matter what day, hour of the day, in whatever neighborhood you're cutting through, it's just bumper to bumper. It's gridlock. It used to be the morning commute and the afternoon commute. It's basically all day long. I assume that the men and women that are working for you are, uh, are seeing some type of. I know they get the lights and whistles and they get to kind of go around the cars and go through the red lights. However, the gridlock is such that it's got to be causing some type of delay in response. Um, and if you know, we can help you add to those to the ranks uh, to eliminate that situation. I'd be we're, we're happy you. to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Edwards. Hi. Hi. Um, for, so first of all, thank you again for your service in East Boston, and I wanted to come on the record saying that it is we see a huge difference already, and that uh, we also feel very very much listened to and valued um, by getting that second ambulance. And I know. I think in this budget cycle it'll become permanent. Right now yes. it's on overturn. Yeah, and I was just curious how much that cost is to make it permit permanent. Well, for the whole year, I, did, I could. I could we could do the math and get that to you. I know from March 12th through the end of this fiscal year, uh, on the premise that that was over time, 16 hours a day times two people, it was 175,000 from from when we began in March. So, so it we, would go up we, from that. Yeah, we could extrapolate okay. it from that. Okay, um, and <clears throat> but in any event, I think for us, uh, it's been proven to to work. And from your um, PowerPoint presentation, it seems like other communities are also benefiting from it as well. Yeah, we've seen a reduction in the uh, priority median mm -hmm. one uh, priority one median response time in uh, Charlestown mm -hmm. on uh, the day shift, and South Boston on the day and evening shift, and. I think that's more than a coincidence because the call volumes aren't down in those communities. Right. I think we're we're now less reliant on having to pull resources from those neighborhoods over to backfill because the first truck or the second truck mm -hmm. is tied up in East Boston. I, believe it or not, that's still happening. Both those trucks over there in the same call every now and then. And we're still pulling somebody over, but we don't have to routinely go to that. Right. And it, Charlestown's probably seeing uh, uh, the best secondary effect for that. So right. the people in Charlestown, all the people in East Boston, uh, thank you. We're getting a second ambulance bay in Charlestown. As I understand it, are you also going to be providing an additional ambulance there? In Charlestown? Mm -hmm, on Main Street. I know there's been some talk, but I haven't gotten any official word okay. on that. All right, yet. just curious, because I, sure. I, I, we've, we've, I met with the developers, at least they're building it. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're getting 
Yeah, or it's being, maybe the older one is being replaced and moved over there. But in any event, I would love to keep talking about the ambulance in, in Charlestown. But great job in East Boston. Um, I wanted to switch the topic a little bit to talk about um, your resources that you have available for your staff when it comes to PTSD yes. or secondhand PTSD. So um, I know that you guys were there during the bombing and you're there at the most, I think, tragic and most intense moments in people's lives. And so in terms of, uh, walk me through the resources that you have available to help your staff overcome that. And having worked in legal services and having worked in uh, with traffic, human trafficking victims myself, we, we, we had to form a secondary or secondhand PTSD support group because of the constant visitations and converse, conversations about trauma, just as legal services folks, we weren't recognizing that in ourselves, the depression and the burnout and so on and so forth. So I am particularly interested in knowing the resources you're providing and, um, and if you need an increase in them. Oh, thank you. We, I'd say going back, well over 25 years ago, we, we recognized that that was an issue for folks in EMS. I know the, you know, I, I've been here, it'll be, it'll be 40 years next month, and we always knew that, you know, the police department had, quote, a stress unit, they mm -hmm. used to call it that, and fire had their services. So a lot of people who worked here with us uh, certainly recognized that there were issues that, you know, affected our providers as well. A lot of our members went out and uh, got some of their own training in peer support, uh, CISD, critical incident stress debriefing, how to conduct those. The Then the uh, union that represented EMTs and paramedics went out and actually contracted with some private providers who were specialized in that, who offer uh, facilities where you can go for uh, uh, I hesitate to use time, I'm not an expert in this, but a place you can go off-site. Uh, it's actually, it was called the On-Site Academy. It was a place you could go, it was a little bit out in the suburbs, and uh, work with clinicians to help you deal with issues like that. So that was in place for a long time. And then if we had an incident where, like you said, there was a, uh, multiple deaths, so you had a uh, death of a child, or maybe you had you know, a department member who either died or was a suicide or another public safety member because we work closely with police and fire and if something happens to one of them, that affects our personnel as well. Mm -hmm. We always had <coughs> procedures to follow up with that. Mm -hmm. The department and the commission uh, then assumed, they used to be like entirely funded by the membership. And then the department and the commission, now we have uh, a line in the budget that pays for our professional services for that. We put that out to contract. Uh, that's, I believe that's a three-year contract as well. And currently, we we have a couple of clinicians who are on call for us 24-7, uh, 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 male and female. Uh, one of them was a psychiatric nurse in the emergency room at Boston Medical Center for years. So she doesn't just know her trade or her profession. She she knows what our people do because she worked hand in hand with them. We offer uh, peer counseling. We have a group of individuals who have taken uh, uh, certified training through different organizations to help do diffusing after incidents. We might pull, pull a crew in after a particularly disturbing call, uh, sometimes whether they want to do it or not, because a lot of people are fairly mm -hmm. macho and think they're resilient in this business, and even if we're not, but you try to put on the brave face and move on. So lots of times they will have a little bit of time out, and if the, uh, the group says, hey, we're gonna give somebody a little more time, or we think it's probably best if we send uh, uh, Jimmy home. We, our managers won't question that. We'll just go with the recommendations there, just tell them to take the rest of the day off. Uh, and obviously they try to direct them to do something Productive, something here doesn't mean like, hey, head to the nearest bar room. You know, they, they try to have some structure, what they're going to do with that. Uh, so there's, there's volunteer members on every shift that are trained. We have a peer support coordinator uh, who currently, right now, uh, he's a, a lieutenant who uh, 
he's primarily in the evening shift, but he floats to different shifts where we need him, uh, which kind of gives him pretty good cover to work with different individuals. We have uh, people who come into our peer support uh, center, which is located uh, in our Miranda Kramer building. There's a couple of offices down on the first floor where it's pretty much, we don't have anything else down there. Uh, there's some other storage and then maybe some other uh, property management has something down there. So if you're going down there, it's you're not parading through like an office here where everyone's seeing you and wondering, hey, what are you doing to you? Don't you work nights in Brighton? No, if you want to come in, you can meet. They book appointments with the counselors and, uh, you know, and I'm you know, and I'm pleased to say people aren't afraid to do it. They, they, they see them on day and evening hours uh, down there. And we also have, uh, they make exceptions outside of that. The, there's a Thursday is a set day for it when they have regularly scheduled hours. Mm -hmm. But they will uh, make off hour ones where people can come in and get seen. If somebody needs a little bit more uh, uh, time out, uh, they'll approach us and uh, uh, ask can we grant some vacation or some other leave to somebody and uh, there's a facility uh, located uh, outside of Boston where they can go for a week and if they think they need more they'll make a recommendation to us for that uh, they never tell us what's wrong yeah, it's we try to be very careful about right. that if they think somebody's at risk you know if if they thought somebody was suicidal they would me yes they would tell us like say hey this person's in a safe place, but we got to take care of him now. You know, and they, they went, and they may not come right out and tell you what it is because we're trying to maintain their confidence. We don't want people to be afraid to, to go to that unit, and we don't want people to think that that's going to be or communicated to management. Right. It, it, it really isn't. Uh, Virginia Famolari, who was a lieutenant that was in there before, she was an EMT that ran that unit. She was promoted to lieutenant. She was in there for a bit. She, she basically had the authority just to put my my authorizing number down next mm -hmm. to a schedule change if we had to move somebody. And, uh, and if we had to use somebody to get somebody to go to a program, we also use a, a facility up in Brattleboro, Vermont, mm -hmm. and uh, Mc McLean. We do have, like, for lack of a better term, mutual aid agreements with other right. facilities so that if, if, if uh, the facility we use normally locally isn't best for what's ailing the person, uh, this place that we can refer out. And there's a, there's a network among peer support agencies with police and fire where my understanding is they help each other out, hmm. where they might say like, for, for whatever reason, maybe somebody doesn't want to come forward here for whatever, They've, they can talk to their counterparts from one of these other public safety agencies because they may be able to find that specialty bed somewhere because hmm. They have, a, they have, a, they have a, a relationship right. with somebody who's on staff at McLean where if we're calling, they may say, hey, we're full up, or we're calling someone, they're, they're like, so-and-so can get you. So they, they, they try to support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Savi George. Thank you again, Chair. And thank you, Chief, for your, um, for your uh, thoughtfulness and sort of hanging in there because this has been a long hearing. Um, I have two, just two remaining questions. Uh, one, to continue on Councillor Flaherty's questions about Bragdon Street, I actually have the opposite feeling of him. I think that we should get out of any property that we're leasing across the city. And um, I look back at my notes from last year and see that we've increased, you know, we're paying, tw you know, I think it was $26,000 a month in a lease there, we're paying about $28,000 a month now. I suspect that that is through the renewal of that contract. And we have a lot of property across the city of Boston that the city owns that is really being underutilized. Um, and I think that we've invested um, too much in Bragdon Street for a property that's really not of the quality of <coughs> for EMS or for uh, the Office of Emergency Management and that response group. Um, I'm also disappointed that we're renting, and this isn't a reflection on you, I think just on city policy, that we're renting from Harvard. And um, I think Council McCarthy referenced a hearing order um, that Council Edwards and I put up on pilot. And just, you know, we have too many partners um, that aren't paying their fair share and we're still paying them rent. 
I just want to say that, get that on the record, um, that we should be out of Bragdon Street. Um, I do have a question about uh, training and coordination with the Boston Public Schools in response to any um, active shooter situation or a significant incident in one of our schools. Can you talk a little bit about EMS's role in uh, that preparation? Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, I'm trying to think, I was been thinking a little bit about that, and you'll recall going back a dozen plus years ago when CPR training uh, and getting AEDs for schools was like new. You know, when he, we, we, I remember there was a, you know, there was a young kid at, you know, a Latin who died at a football practice or somebody else in the school, and, and there was a, a real push to get that in. Members from our department did a lot of that initial training. They did a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the sessions in all the schools. And I remember one year when they had a little celebration that they had uh, finally had placed up uh, AEDs in all the schools and had people trained in every building. It's, it's, it's a big task to do all that training. So what we did over the years was we worked with uh, uh, their, for lack of a better word, term, preparedness division of public schools. I remember Rick Draney working with him to for them to be able to get certified instructors to go out and do their own teaching so that they could maintain that. And you know, they did that. Now they maintain defibs there, similar to like you've got a, a dozen in this building. And we've done some training here. With one of the things we were looking at uh, doing, and we piloted a little bit here, we did some we did a training in here not too long ago where we did CPR training, some training for AEDs, but also stop the bleed training for stop the bleed training for people who could be victims of penetrating trauma from a mass shooting or uh, or you know anything else that could cause external hemorrhage. And it was pretty well uh, received here. We were looking at uh, we did a pilot program, and one was a UASI request. I think one was in the uh, Winthrop Public Schools. They, they wanted to do a little training on that because Winthrop felt like we're, we're an island. We're out at the end. We're pretty far from hospitals. Help's going to be coming for a bit to get to us. They wanted to see if they could do some uh, training in there. So with the uh, Office of Public Health Preparedness and uh, some grants we got through uh, OEM downstairs, we felt, developed some training there. So the the concept of extending that training out to schools in Boston is something that's certainly possible to do, especially if we, I think if we meet with uh, some of the personnel from school department who have maintained the CPR training, because like I said, it's, it's, it's a big task for us. Well, to I'd love to see all of our students CPR trained and certified prior to graduation. I think it fits very nicely in with their curriculum. So I think this sort of first aid response mm -hmm. um, training might too. I'm um, interested though in the response from Boston EMS in the incident of an active shooter. Has Boston EMS been incorporated into any of the trainings that BPD has done in case of an incident? So there is an active shooter on a school campus. Um, what's Boston EMS's role in that work? Talk a little bit about the training and the relationship with BPD and BPS in your response, because EMS plays a very specific life-saving uh, role in, uh, in that response. Sure, we have, uh, we've done training with the Boston Police Department going back to uh, not, not long after uh, Columbine, you know, when, when there was, you know, delays of people accessing that, uh, that high school campus on, uh, and some of the lessons learned there. Law enforcement really took the lead on trying to figure out what's the quickest way to either get rescuers in or get uh, victims who have the chance to survive out. We, they started doing a lot of training around that, training around that as far as not even waiting for SWAT teams to send contact teams in with uh, the first arrived patrolman, four patrolmen right. show up, they form, and I, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to speak to their operations and tactics, but the, the only reason we're familiar with it is because we've, we've done a lot of training with that. Mm -hmm. All our recruits get it. We've done uh, occasional training in here with them. Uh, as far as uh, enhancing that to work more with uh, SWAT teams, 
Uh, that's that's something that's uh, in in progress here now too. As far as working directly with the schools in that, I can't say that I'm familiar that we have. We've done some stuff with some of the colleges now that are doing that, when the universities who are looking to to do that in conjunction with their own uh, police departments. But obviously, we like the BBD to be the lead on that. You know, especially with the people who are going to decide whether a room is safe enough for us to enter. Even if this, even if it means that we're just covering it, hey, it's safe for now. Get in, get in, guys and girls, get out. Mm -hmm. That works. Uh, similar to what you saw on the, uh, you know, the finish line of the bombing that day up on Boylston Street. The bomb squad was saying like, hey, there's already been two devices. There's no reason to think there aren't more. We got to clear this scene. And now there's unattended packages everywhere. People are dropping their bags, what have you, and. But the idea there was like, okay, it was you were in the danger zone, but you mac you you moved as quick as you could to clear that scene, and that scene was moved pretty quick, and you got the people out who had the chance to survive first, and you distribute them. So that that concept, that goal, that uh, operating procedure is one that we do want to bring in to the schools mm -hmm. or businesses as well. Uh, but I think uh, we probably would do well to reach out to. Uh, they're preparing as people at the schools to see if we can't get together with them. Because the drills that we have done in the BPS schools have been, uh, the, the BPD have done it like in the Rogers School up in Hyde Park, which right. is vacant. Right. You know, right. and then, so you're not, not that you want, you don't want to use kids for props, but we've, some of our uh, Urban Shield exercises that we did mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, uh, we did in, uh, when we did it in a school in Quincy, and we did one in uh, Brookline at Pine Manor College where they turned classrooms into an active shooter. And we went in and we practiced with right. various things doing it there. I, I would like to see at a minimum just your um, EMTs and paramedics have an opportunity to walk through some of our schools because they are, um, some of them have a very traditional sort of expected layout, but many of them still with that have some nooks and crannies. So I've, you know, I've advocated for this with Commissioner Evans that not just the SWAT team, but the local cop that's, the you know, the, the local patrolman who's on during the day is likely going to be the one that will be the first responder, yeah. the first one into a building. And so to have a, a general awareness of how many floors are in a particular school, how many wings, how many stairwells, and just sort of a general feel for the layout of the school, I think is so valuable. And unfortunately, you know, we don't want to, we're not pulling out blueprints in the, in the midst of an active shooter case. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I want to um, put that out there. I appreciate that you've been working with BPD. I think we have a real opportunity to become more connected with BPS and to, to have an opportunity to get, you know, the recruits, but then also your current men and women of the department just to visit. And I think it can also lend itself to future recruiting of future EMTs, is, you know, for, for our kids in our high schools especially to see, and in middle schools and elementary as well, but to see your men and women in their buildings I think can be inspiring to some of these kids to consider a career uh, with Boston EMS. I appreciate your work, and I just leaned over. I said, "Did he really say 40 years? That's a pretty amazing. Congratulations." Yeah. Yeah. He was Thanks. 15. He, he was lied 15 on his when yeah, he shot his summer job. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Chief, and thank you, Laura, for yeah. being here. Also, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Laura. Um, you know, please express to all the staff at EMS, the deep appreciation that all, all of my colleagues expressed here today for what they do every single day for our residents and our visitors. And Chief Hooley, thank you for your dedication and commitment for the past almost 40 yes. years. Mm. Well, no thanks. And I, I, what I, I meant to say this to all the councils earlier and I should have, but uh, uh, I got some nice thank yous and stuff today, but but honestly, uh, I have the I have the easiest job in the department. Uh, what, what our personnel are doing up in dispatch from the field every day, what they're dealing with, uh, th there's a lot of calls that go great. They go by the book, the way you draw them up, and there's a lot of other calls mm -hmm. where it's, you gotta be so creative to, right. pull, to pull it off, to get the person to yeah. go, to keep a fight from breaking out or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, to get somebody to go who really has to go, kind of like what Council Flaherty was alluding to, you know, the, the extra steps they take, and I mean, as much as I'm privileged to come here and advocate for them, 
they sell themselves. I mean, right. you've been out, you, you roll with them, you've seen them, they're like, their good work speaks for itself so good. Absolutely. I, yeah. you know, it, it made my job awful easy. Well, we thank you. I please extend it to them, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.